Hello, hello, everyone, and welcome to our uh, special. Normally, these are Sunday night super streams, but this is a Saturday night uh, set spooper, super system stream. Spectacular. And uh, tonight, we are going to be talking about Fate Core, or Fate in general, the ecosystem. And we have a special guest. We are joined by uh, Fate uh, big fate apologist and, and supporter, uh, John, John from the Patreon. Welcome, John. How's it going? Good. It's going very, very well. Uh, John, you've been uh, a member of Nights of the Last Call now for, I would say, what, six months, five months, give or take? Somewhere, right? Less than a year. Yeah, yeah less than a year. Months or so. And, uh, you know, since John joined, you've sort of been a big... Uh, fate supporter within the within the sort of discord evangelist yeah, yeah. Ev ev evangelist <laughs> is a good way to describe it um and you know john uh reached out to me and said hey you know would, would you like to talk about fate i think it'd be awesome john even did a, a giveaway inside of our discord gave somebody uh some fate books and guess what we got some more we need to send this out by the way <laughs> <laughs> we've got some more we've got more fate books to hand out and we're gonna be doing a giveaway uh, uh later in the stream uh, and we're going to be, somebody's going to be coming, taking home some fate books. So, uh, I think that's uh, very generous of John and, uh, appreciate you being on here and willing to talk with us today. Um, yeah, having me. <laughs> so apparently, uh, <laughs> apparently unfortunate pumpkin is already, uh, is already buying books. Um, <laughs> from... I think he bought all of them. At this point. <laughs> <laughs> they are very beautiful books. Um, I love them. I love the, you know, the, the color of them, the shape of them. They've got that great evil hat production quality. Um, and uh, yeah, I, it's a really cool system. And I think before we kind of get into it, I want to kind of outline what this stream is going to be. Uh, we're going to aim for about two hours today. And we're going to spend this first hour, we're going to talk about fate. We're going to talk about the different fate systems. There's a couple of them out there. Fate Accelerated, Fate Condensed, Fate Core. Talk about the evolution of fate, and how it arrived to where it is. And then I want to talk about what is fate. What are sort of like, you know, what in, in John's mind, what are the three or five main pillars of fate. And, you know, I'm not, we're not going to teach you the game, although it is pretty simple. Uh, <laughs> it, you'll, you'll probably know how to play fate by the time we're done with this uh, stream. Uh, At least well enough. Yeah. But, uh, oh, we got a super chat from Mr. Damian Williams. He said, fate is great RPGing. It certainly RPG! is. I completely agree. RPG! RPG! It's uh, the, one of the role playing games. Yes. In fact, um, and we'll talk a little bit about this because, you know, you know me, I like to talk about GNS and I like to talk about how things connect. And fate has an fate has a very interesting dynamic in that space. Um, and I, I think it's really, really particularly interesting. And it does some things that no other game systems really do. Blades in the Dark doesn't do them. Uh, Powered by the Apocalypse doesn't do them. So we're going to talk about where fate strengths are and where its cons are. And then. The last hour or 45 minutes or so, I think John and I are probably going to take your questions, you know, specifically try to focus on those and answer those. We'll do our giveaway. So about halfway through the stream, we'll do our giveaway. And then, you know, we'll maybe just kind of talk about some of our personal stories, some awesome things that happen in Fate that you really maybe couldn't see in some other games. And I certainly have some some fun stories to tell. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. Um, yeah. So, John, first things first, uh, what in your mind uh is fate all about like what 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 uh, drives so the fate game system the way i like to explain it is a collaborative cinematic rpg instead of a typical role-playing game i think that does a better job of explaining what it's about uh one of my favorite quotes i wish i could remember where or who said it i think i saw it on reddit or something at one point but someone said uh fate is not about succeeding or failing it's about looking cool doing it and i think that is like the uh the mantra of, of fate and like what we try to capture when we play fate it's like failing in fate is part of the story as well right if you think of any movie right the heroes aren't just steamrolling everything right to have right. to have you know drama and everything the heroes are often failing right actually they usually fail more i think than they succeed in most good movies uh and then you eventually reach the climax and you know they kind of so i think yes that's the hardest thing for people to get into is failing yes fail first I yes absolutely i could not agree with you more um because if you watch most movies there's this weird thing which does not translate well in any other rpg which is somehow the heroes keep getting their butt kicked or things keep going against them right like our heroes don't resolve tension in the beginning of TV shows or in the beginnings of games or the beginnings of movies. No, things keep getting worse, right? 
you know, they jump out of the frying pan into the fire. Things just exactly. keep escalating and escalating and escalating. And we get downbeats. We get moments where we're able to kind of catch our breath. But for the most part, the tension continues to escalate. The stakes get higher and higher. Things get worse and worse. And it's then, somehow, when our heroes are beat up, you know, bloodied. They've been through hell and back. That's when they win, right? That's when they're at their strongest. And fate does that really, really well. Uh, yeah, and through the consequences system and the, you know, the the, asp the way aspects work, I think it does a fantastic job of modeling that. And that's kind of why I think instead of describing it as like a traditional role-playing game, a cinematic RPG, I think, is a better way to put it because you're really trying to mimic that, that experience you would get from watching a movie or reading a book or watching a TV show, but in a more emergent fashion, I guess. Yeah, absolutely, right? Because you have that ability to sort of come in there and say, hey, I... You know, I want to, I want to be part of this storytelling experience. It's not just pre-written for me. It's actually something that's happening kind of, you know, in person at the, at the moment of creation. And, and I'm there for it. I'm part of it. I think that's as a GM, it's fantastic because you virtually, you could go into a session with zero prep every session and just, it would work Yes, because I <laughs> you don't need maps. You don't, you know, you, you don't even, you really just need the beats, right? Yeah. You need to know what the overall beats of the story you want to tell is. Yep. And even those are generated by usually if you're playing, you know, rules is written, those are generated up front together with the players in like a session zero. So it doesn't take a lot of effort from a GM and you're less of a storyteller as a GM and more of a rules arbiter, I guess. Right. So uh, let's first talk about, you mentioned about what you need to play. So let's, so, let's talk really quickly in my mind about what you need to play uh, a fate. Um, and now, John, we are, we, we are we are getting a, we are getting John we are getting a little bit of that echo there from, from before. Oh, okay. um, um, so I don't know if you need to turn down your speakers or something, but yeah. it's good. Um, so fate uses um, some weird dice. Uh, I call them fudge dice because fate actually is derived from a game called Fudge. But uh, you can call you can find them as fate dice now or fudge dice. Uh, and fudge dice are uh, six sided, but they're virtually three sided because there's two sides that have a plus, two sides that have a minus, and two sides that are blank. And in fate, you'll you'll need some of these. Uh, you'll need four of them actually. I is usually called the minimum. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mean, per player is ideally what yeah. you would have, right? Um, it's usually abbreviated four DF. They call it like a mm -hmm. DF. Um, and this is going to generate. Uh, you, the pluses are plus one, the minuses are minus one, and the blanks are zero. And so you roll your four dice, and you're going to get a nice little parabola with most results being between, you know, plus two, minus two. But sometimes, yeah, but sometimes you're going to get a plus four, and sometimes you're going to get a minus four. Um, and that is sort of the, that's the dice mechanic. There are no other dice. And that pretty much handles everything in the game, whether you succeed or not, whether you deal damage or not. Um, everything is handled by those four dice. The other thing which you're going to need are fate points. Now, if you're playing online, you can use some sort of current, you know, sort of online tracker. When we play, we love to use poker chips. That's sort of been our, you know, sort of go go to because the I think the the main thing that sort of defines fate to me are fate points. So, yes. on a broad level, John, explain to me, explain to us, what are fate points? Fate points are your your meta currency, right? So we haven't talked about aspects and everything yet, but fate points are a tool to uh, invoke their traits of your character or other characters or the scene or wherever these traits are a part of for mechanical effect. So we'll talk a little bit about aspects and what they are later, but in general, it's a way to give you a boost, for lack of a better term, to your role. Yep. So normally when you roll 4DF, you add your skill modifier, um, but that's not always enough, right? And, and fate points are a uh, a resource that lets you kind of decide, I only have a limited amount of this, but I think this is a point in the story where I really want to succeed. So I'm going to spend one of this limited resource to kind of add a plus two, or if your roll's really bad, you can also choose to re-roll it entirely. Right. Um, which is kind of dangerous, but sometimes it makes sense. So, you know, from a certain point of view, fate, uh, fate points can look on the surface like Pathfinder 2 hero points, right? Uh, it's a reroll or, you know, you get to have a bonus after the fact. So on that level, that's pr pretty true. 
the main distinction is, in my opinion, is number one, how you get them. And number two, when or how you're allowed to use them. So in fate, in order to spend a fate point, you have to be, you have to have some sort of aspect or component of your character or part of the scene or part of the, you know, the enemy, which you are able to essentially uh, invoke or tag or, or use an excuse. See in Pathfinder two, you can just spend a hero point in fifth edition. Mm -hmm. You can just spend your inspiration, but in fate, you have to have some sort of mechanical aspect, either of your character or of the person you're working against or the scene where you say, hey, this is why my character is getting a bonus here. Okay, my character is, quote, the greatest swordsman that ever lived. And I'm in a duel right now and I just rolled really badly. Well, I'm gonna spend my fate point to allow myself to re-roll because I'm the greatest swordsman that ever lived. Now, could I use that fate point to, I don't know, if I'm jumping over a crevasse, well, probably not, because what does that have to do with me being the greatest right. swordsman that ever lived? So but you might have another aspect you could tag for like a better term. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> but but you know, I think that what it really comes down to is the the traits, the background, the 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 image of your character directly translate to a mechanical impact on the game. Yeah. Another thing you can do with fate points, which you can't do in games like mm -hmm. 5e or Pathfinder 2 is you can use them to declare a story detail. So normally when you're talking, you know, you're figuring out the story with your group, the dice are kind of king. And then for anything the dice isn't involved in, you kind of discuss it as a group. But sometimes you want to say, no, I want this to happen. Like as a player, I want this to be a thing. You can just spend a fate point and say, this is what it's going to be, whether, you know, you guys like it or not. <laughs> and that can be a good thing. It can be a bad thing. You know, I'm oftentimes in a good fate game, you'll have people coming out and like purposely endangering themselves or putting themselves in complicated situations because it results in a more interesting story or a more fun story. Exactly. So. And this gets back to what you said earlier, John, about it being a more cinematic type mm -hmm. game. Uh, look, I'm always a big believer that in any role playing game, you should you should be thinking about the story and not thinking about your character. I understand that for a lot of people. Uh, and, and, I, and we talked about this on our GNS stream. We talked about the different player modes. We talked about the idea of an actor, of an author, and of a director. And it's sort of being in the mindset of how do I approach this game? And I think a lot of people kind of put themselves into the actor role right, where they view themselves as I am my character. What I want is aligned with what my character wants. But I think fate asks you to take a step back and fate gives you more tools. It puts you a little bit behind the camera. Maybe you're you're an actor in the movie, but you're also, you know, you're one of those people who directs and acts at the same time. Because fate is like really asking yourself, but is this a good, is this, would this, would this make a good story or not? And sometimes in fate, you're gonna find yourself in a situation where you might, as John said, use your fate point to make, maybe just do something just because it's interesting. And now, of course, GMs, I think, ultimately do have the final say, John, but. Um, yeah, they can veto it, but it's, but it's, it's frowned upon. Gaming, I try not to do that unless right. there's like a very good reason, like right. something way out. My, you know. my rule of thumb is if you find yourself having to constantly veto your players doing that, you're probably playing with the wrong group of people. Yeah, exactly. Right. It's not a problem with the system. It's a problem with your players or it's a problem yeah. with you. Maybe you're just, a, you know, a problem yourself. Um, but getting back to what you talked about, about having sort of a, of a more author viewpoint of or, or director viewpoint, what does this make for a good story? The other side, which is different from Pathfinder 2 is in Pathfinder 2, the person who decides for the most part, when you get a hero point is the GM. And it's done kind of by fiat. You know, it's kind of like, oh, it's been an hour. Uh, that was pretty cool, I guess. I don't know, here's a hero point. Yeah. It's very different in fate. Yeah, so the fate point economy is actually really important in fate because fate points are kind of how your party lives or dies, for lack of a better term. They don't really, it's really hard to die in fate, but um, it's really important to keep your player's fate point coffers full, but it's also important to make sure they're not too full. So you really want to, and this is something that you'll kind of just learn as you go, but essentially the way it works is you can 
you know, when, when players evoke their invoke their aspects or other aspects, they'll spend a fate point um, or they spend a fate point to, um, you know, invoke a story detail, but they only get three at the start of every session. But the way they gain more is through this idea of compels and compels are kind of the inverse of invoking. So with invoking, you're invoking for a bonus, right? With compels, you're saying the GM or even one of the other players can say, hey, I'll give you a fate point if you let this thing happen. It's a bribe. You know, it, yeah, it's a bribe. Yeah, exactly. It, it really is a bribe. And, and it's usually, you know, it's always a complication that you're proposing. Right. So to go back to our example before, remember, we described our character and in fate, we would call this an aspect. But and this is something mechanical. You write it down in your sheet, just like you would write down a feat in Pathfinder 2. You're going to have an aspect on your character. And it might say, I am the greatest swordsman that ever lived. So your characters are there and you're trying to escape. You've rescued the prince from the dungeons and you're trying to beat a hasty escape. And, you know, you're, you're sort of doing a, a running chase. And then suddenly you see him, the six fingered man you know, the, the, a, a noted duelist and he stops you for a moment and he draws his blade and he says, tear to, you know, t you know, tear to test your steel. And you go, nah, we gotta get out of here. And then the GM goes, he kind of holds up a fate point and he goes, what about it? Are, he's challenging whether you're, are you really the greatest swordsman that ever lived? Yeah, and, exactly. And the player's going to smile and nod if you're doing it correctly. It, 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 when, uh, fate can fail. I've seen fate fail is when people don't take compels mm -hmm. is when people say, nope, I'm just going to keep running because what ends up happening is one, the story stagnates and two, they run out of fate points, which means now they can't do anything cool either. And they're just playing a game where they're just rolling four dice fudge and adding and it. Keep in mind, enemies also have, or the GM also has fate points to spend on enemies as well. So like if your, your players are all out of fate points and you're like the GM and you're spending fate points on your NPCs, now all of a sudden your PCs are just going to get steamrolled. And <laughs> right, right. They're going to a situation where they have to concede the conflict. Or... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. You, I mean, I, this is one of, one of the things I like about fate, and I think it's something that people miss. There is a game to the storytelling, mm -hmm. right? Like part of the skill of fate is knowing how to manipulate the situation and cause problems for your character to sort of build up a bank of fate points so that when you get to the end of that really maximum drama, you know, the boss fight, if you will, the, the big encounter at the end of a session or a scenario, that's when you have this thick stack of fate points and you can literally be the hero of the movie. Right. And, and, and if you play, there's a skill to that. There's sort of a nuance to that. Um, but point is the GM is going to look for those opportunities, but even you as a player are going to look for those opportunities, right? You might say to the GM, Hey GM, um, I'm thinking I'm going to, you know, I know we're here to supposed to make peace and talk nice. I think I'm going to challenge this guy to a duel, uh, because I want to prove to him that I'm the greatest swordsman that ever lived. What do you think? Is that, is that worth a fate point? And you know, GM will say, yeah, sure. You know, uh, you can compel yourself or you can mm -hmm. suggest it to other players. Um, there's a very much a, a group participation aspect to it. Uh, and I, I think that part is so much fun. I mean, for me, that's what really makes fate sing. And the interesting thing. So when players compel another player, they actually give that player one of their fate points. Absolutely. So it's a way to kind of trade between each other. Right. But when a GM compels a player, they have an unlimited pool of fate points to compel. So they should be throwing, like, keeping track of how many fate points all the players have and looking for opportunities to compel them every step of the way. Absolutely, because that's a great way to say, like, am I involving this character? Well, if yeah. I haven't been making compels, if I haven't been kind of causing problems for them and bringing these issues up for them, uh, maybe it's time for me to do that. Because even mechanically in the game, I'm not doing my due diligence as a game master if I'm not trying to psych those out. So, so we've talked about fates and we talked about these fate points and we've talked about aspects. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna bring up the um I'm gonna bring up the character sheet here for fate. Frosty posted in the chat. He said, Does fate have APs to help create a story? Um so the idea of fate is that you're it's a generic setting agnostic system. Uh and typically when you're playing fate, you will have a session zero where you get together with your players, you determine what genre, what story you want to tell, who the big bad is, and you'll kind of craft this kind of framework yourselves. That said, there are third party and first party uh, books 
yeah. built around fate. For instance, this one's called Do see if I can, Do Fate, which is about fairy dragon things. Um, I have one here called Interface Zero, which was extremely popular. It's a fate edition of Interface Zero. And these are all like uh yeah. kind of settings and yep. You know, they have things like stunts built out for you and archetypes and things to kind of jumpstart you because in my experience, unless you're with you know experienced fate players, that kind of session zero setting setup is actually quite challenging because players aren't typically used to kind of having that much say sure in the game they're playing. So if I often recommend if you're coming from like a D20 background, it's often best to kind of skip that at first and kind of just as a GM come up with something to get going, but leave enough room for the players in play to have a say because that's what's important is the is in play the players being able to influence the story with their own whims yeah and i was gonna say um i have a couple of these these are these are really small they're real thin um and these are these are these little fate worlds um mm -hmm. and they're only like 30 pages long now is it an ap no it's not a like i'm gonna spell out every encounter that you're gonna go through i'm gonna detail all of the you know the stats of every single creature but, you know, this one here is called the Aether Sea, and it's kind of like a spell jammer esque. You know, you're on these, you know, wooden start, you know, wooden sailing ships in space. Um, and this one's called Romancing in the Air, which is sort of like a an alternate universe, you know, early 1900s um, pre World War One. But, you know, we have like flying Zeppelin cities. Anyways, point is, these books kind of really, you know, can give you these crazy groundworks and sort of lay the foundation. But really, fate is about you and your group telling the story. Um, yeah. and, and I think having, like John said, I think having a, a starting off place is fantastic. But in terms of like where it goes after that, it's up to you and your players. I mean, that's the, the beauty of the system, really. Yeah, I think APs are actually counterproductive to what fate is trying to do. So that's probably why I'm, I'm sure if you scrounge, you know, drive through RPG, there's probably some out there, but I wouldn't recommend them. I would recommend you guys. Think, right, you know. because I think at that point you're leaning into what the game is really about. Now, again, yeah. I think having a strong understanding of, hey, we're not going to design all, we're not going to design our own world from scratch. You can do that. And the game actually does give you some pretty good advice on how to do that. But if you start mm -hmm. off with this cool idea of, you know, hey, we're all, we're all pirates, you know, in the Aether Sea. And, uh, you know, we're, we're going to go on some high adventure and, you know, uh, got cool ideas for your character. Oh, I'll be like the first mate and I'll be like the ship's doctor or whatever. And then boom, you go from there and you know, the GM is just yep. going to create some interesting ideas and you're going to, the players are really feeding into this. I cannot stress that enough because they yeah, have no classes. There's no right. races necessarily. Like if you, if you want to be an elf, you're an elf. Congratulations. <laughs> maybe you make it an aspect. Maybe you just say, Hey, I'm an elf, you know? Like, yeah. <laughs> so, so I brought up the character sheet here, John. So yeah. let's talk a little bit about, what making a character in fate is. Cause this is it. This is the whole sheet. Um, sure, yep. And in my experience, the only thing in fate that can trouble a lot of people uh, is coming up with aspects. Mm -hmm. um, and we could talk about that. And stunts. Stunts and, can be challenging. And stunts well. can be challenging as well. But um, so uh, a fate character is essentially uh, a list of aspects and skills and, and stunts. That's pretty much about it. So we talked about aspects before. These are the things that you can compel, and these are the things that you can sort of use. I'll bring up the cheat sheet here real quick. Um, there we go. So when you are inside of a, a fate game, uh, you're going to be rolling to make, you know, just like in normal games of, of D20, you're, you're going to be rolling against a DC. Uh, okay, like I need to get two. I need to get three. I need to get four. And remember, you're rolling those fudge dice or those fate dice, and they're going to generate a number between negative four to positive four. Most of the time though, it's gonna be negative two to positive two because of the way probabilities work. Mm -hmm. And you're gonna add a, a, a skill. So you might have sword fighting, two. So I'm gonna roll four dice fudge and I'm gonna add two. And that's my total number. And did that get, did that beat the, the DC or not? Okay, that, that's pretty basic. We're used to that. That's, you know, there's a couple of caveats to that, but that's the basic gist of it. So the where DC could be a passive opposition like you would in Pathfinder, or it could be a, a natural contested role in, in like conflicts and stuff. So. Uh, Satir, take care. Uh, happy to have you here for a little bit. 
Um, yeah, so Steven asks, uh, so these are all sandbox games. Uh, yeah, I kind of think so. I mean, I guess it depends what your definition of a sandbox correct. game is. Right? If you mean sandbox game as in, I mean, in theory, in a role-playing game, players should be able to do whatever they want anyways. But I mean, like, obviously the GM, like, you can have, like, your your NPCs or whatever can have plans, right? They can have things that they are trying to accomplish. The, the, the key difference here is you shouldn't presume what is going to happen. Like, for example, I know that for me personally, Derek, I have a plan. I want to, uh, you know, I want to go on a trip to Europe next year. So <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to do things that are going to help me get to that, you know, uh, that goal. To, to that goal. Your NPCs are going to be doing the same thing, but I shouldn't presume that I will 100 percent succeed and I will 100 percent get to Europe because what if the PCs stop me? What if the PCs blow up my plane? What if the PCs uh, 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 get my passport revoked? Right. Like. I, I shouldn't, I don't want to cut them off. I don't want to cut their agency off. And fate is so freewheeling and easy to, you know, to, to prep. And there's like very little in the terms of like, there's no monster stats and anything like that in the as such that you can have the ability as a GM to just sort of kind of go with the flow. Mm -hmm. Um, So I wouldn't say, yeah, I would say it's not a, a, a I would say it's not a, a sandbox game. Yeah. I mean, as a GM, I like to have, I mean, you normally you talk with your players up front and say, Hey, what is the kind of game? we're going to go for. And if you're using something like interface zero, a lot of that is implied, but normally you work with them and say, what, what are you trying to do here? What is your ultimate goal with this campaign? And you kind of decide that together. And then once you have that, you know, as a GM, you kind of just come up with the, the major beats, right? And just like you would in any other TTRPG, you know, you kind of take what the players are doing and figure out how they connect to those major beats, you know, you know, I don't say you railroad them, but you know, if a player, if you know, your major beat is, to go save this town from, or this town is under attack by a dragon, right? Um, you can kind of put things in front of the players that kind of suggest, hey, you should probably head this direction, but they're perfectly able not to. They can get, ah, fuck, fuck that, here, screw that town, you know? <laughs> and they can go off and do something else. And as the GM, you're like, oh, well, they didn't save the town. So I guess it got murdered by a dragon. So, and then how does that play into the rest of the story? Like maybe that town not existing was a big deal. If it was part of a major beat, it probably did. Um, and then you kind of just keep going from there. Like And like Derek said, there's no maps. Coming with monsters is very easy to off up your head because monsters, like characters, are just a collection of aspects, usually like one or two, uh, and maybe a couple skills. And so it's really easy just to whip those up real quick. So all right, so it's really easy to freewheel. Yeah, so, so what I did here is I have our character sheet, and then what I did is I brought up uh, an example of a character sheet filled out. This is Zerd the Arcane. Um, and, uh, you know, we don't know what kind of campaign he's from. He's, he, he could be from, uh, you know, some sort of sounds like it's a world where there's magic and, you know, by maybe some, you know, some swords and sorceries or things of that nature. Um, so you have yourself a name, uh, and then your character has, uh, the, the aspects. And these are the, on the left-hand side of our screen of our character sheet. Uh, and these are how we describe our character. And a good aspect, remember, aspects are going to be things that you're going to be able to use fate points for to get bonuses. You're going to be able to add to your dice rolls after the fact. You're going to be able to, and by the way, plus two, on the, when the range is negative four to plus four, plus two is a huge bonus. Mm -hmm. um, just absolutely huge. I mean, that's like <laughs> that's like Pathfinder yeah. 2 equivalent of like getting like a plus five to your die roll, more or less, after the fact. So being able to use these aspects to help you is is a great thing but like john said there is this action or a fate point economy right where you want to be able to also have these aspects cause you trouble sometimes or be a source of problems because you want you need to have a way for fate points to make them their way back to you and so the way that the book helps you when you make a character is it helps you sort of create aspects that are could be good, could be bad. They're just interesting. They tell us about your character. And this is, by the way, the same stuff people do when they make backgrounds for their character. The only difference is in Fate, it actually matters, <laughs> right? Like in D20, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't. In Pathfinder 2, yeah. it doesn't matter. But in Fate, it does matter. So if we take a look at Zerd the Arcane, we can see that his first aspect, which is called your, uh, 
what to call John? It's your main aspect or something? Your high concept. Your high concept. This is sort like of a- your, Yeah, your main aspect. This is like the main thing that you are. A Zerd is a wizard for hire. Note, you're, you're trying to be a little creative here. You don't want to just say wizard. You could say that. Yeah, you don't want to say like, I'm a human wizard. Right. Human wizard artificer. Right. 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 You want to right. use some some adjectives. You want to use some, uh, you know, additional detail. I'm not just a wizard. I'm a wizard for hire. Mm -hmm. And that tells us a little bit more about maybe my character's mercenary bent and, you know, all this other stuff. Uh, but then we have a couple other aspects and the and the book helps you guide through some of these. Some some of some of the aspects should be things that are, you know, maybe troubles or issues from your past. Right. If we were making Superman in fate, one of his aspects might be, you know, weak to kryptonite. Right. That is an aspect um, of my character. In this case, for Zerd, we can see that Zerd has rivals in the Collegia Arcana. By the way, That's if, really we, a trouble. if we were sitting around making this um, at, at a table and I wrote that down, John would go, oh, OK, so there's something called the Collegia Arcana now in our world. Maybe there wasn't before, yeah, but exactly. there is now. <laughs> right. Because so I the interesting thing about aspects is that whether you invoke them or not, they are always true. So if you have an aspect saying you're a wizard for hire, you're a wizard for hire. Like that is true in the narrative you are telling. If you have rivals in the Collegia Arcana, you have those rivals. Those rivals exist. So aspects are not only a way of, you know, they're not just a mechanical thing. They're actually influencing the narrative themselves as well. Right. Exactly. Um, and so, you know, something like rivals in the Collegia Arcana, right? We we could just see how this might lead John to create some problems for me and compel me and give me some fate points, right? Uh, yep. You know, we show up and uh oh, it's one of my rivals from the Collegia Arcana, and they're there to uh, to uh, you know to, to dismiss me or to attack me or to take me in or something like that or to ruin my research or something. Yeah. But maybe they're really strong, and your first instinct as a player would be to run away. But you're like, oh, but these are your rivals. You don't want to see them succeed, you know? So Right. But it also says something about my character. It says I was part of something called the Collegia Arcana. And so there's also a world in which I could even use this to my advantage, right? Like maybe someone is trying to destroy all magic in the city. And I go to my rivals and say, look, you hate me. I hate you. But we can both agree that we need to work together to stop this, right? Because the Collegia Arcana is more important than all of us. I'm going to invoke this and get a bonus. And it's like, yep. yeah, okay, cool. Awesome. Like we're, we're storytelling with our characters. It's storytelling game, but it's very character focused storytelling game. And that's what I think is so interesting and cool about fate. Um, so Frosty says aspect equals personality. Absolutely. It could be a part of your character's personality. It could be part of your character's training, their background, the uh, relationships. In fact, part of fate core, uh, they kind of remove this requirement, I think, a bit in Fate Condensed. But in Fate Core, when you're you know doing the phase trio during character creation, uh, you know you create your high concept, you create your trouble, which is your aspect that's supposed to be more negative than positive. That's the rivals in the Collegiate Arcana um, in this in this example. And then you have usually I'm trying to I can't remember if it's two or I think it's two of your remaining aspects are supposed to be relationships with another player. So like another player's character. So like if you you're like I don't know, um, you know another player character might be uh, the fastest gun in the West, right? And you're like, oh, uh, I had a a shootout with this guy in the past, you know? And maybe you're saying maybe he's now your rival or something, right? Um, so you're kind of develop. It kind of forces you to have relationships with the rest of the party. And generally, the way you want to do it is you want to go around the table to make sure everyone is at least indirectly connected. Correct. So you might not have a direct relationship with every single person in the party, but right. you have a relationship with this guy who then has a relationship with this guy, meaning you have an indirect relationship with this other person. Correct. Because part the game, uh, Fate, is very, very, very distinct about this. It says you should be making your characters together um, mm -hmm. and you should be sitting around and talking about this. So let's say that Frosty... Um, Right, had a you know a a, a character um, in the game, and we're sitting here talking about it. We're trying to build aspects, and the GM says, "Hey, everybody, for your third aspect or your fourth aspect, why don't you work with the, your fellow players and 
Frosty and I start talking about it. You know, I'm, I'm playing Zerd the Arcane, and I say, oh, I write down, um, Frosty will always have my back. And we make up this quick little story about how one time I was in deep shit. The Collegia Arcana had me cornered. They were going to, you know, have me drawn and quartered. And Frosty's character really got me out of a pinch. And I know that I can rely on Frosty. I trust them almost implicitly. They've they've gone up above and beyond to help me. And maybe I feel a certain amount of indebtedness to this. Or maybe I feel a certain amount of, like, I want to repay that. But that is a great way for me to put that into the sheet. And it ties our characters together in a very powerful and meaningful way. Yeah, it's, it kind of solves the your players meet in a tavern kind of situation sure. in a way that actually matters. <laughs> uh, Tiger Lemur, I do see your question. I will try to get back to that uh, when we get to the Q&A. That's part. actually a really, really good question. And when we talk about actions, I will answer it because there is a very good answer to that question. So again, we go through this process. We create these aspects. And these are going to be the things that we tie. Now, keep in mind, your character has aspects but so do the other characters in the scene. But the the GM's NPCs are gonna have aspects. If, if we were fighting a troll, the GM might take a note card and set it down in front of us. And it says the troll is has three aspects, big and scary, razor sharp claws, regenerative skin. Yeah, Those are the aspects for that troll. And the GM is gonna use- He might use, even have weak to fire or something. He could have an aspect that says weak to fire. And I, me, Zerd the Arcane, could spend a fate point to essentially tag or use his weakness to fire to get a bonus. Because by describing that my character is I don't know, producing a flame ball, a fireball. Aspects um, can be hidden as well. So you might not know it's weak to fire at first, but you kind of exp you figure that out when you as you play. Um, additionally, scenes, the scenario can have aspects. In D20 or Pathfinder 2, we're used to creating a grid and we mark terrain and we say, okay, this pit is full of acid and uh, the bridge is crumbling and it counts as difficult terrain and you have to make an acrobatics check to get over it. But in Fate, you would just say, hey, you guys are fighting in this uh, old decrepit cavern and it's got a couple of aspects. One aspect, pits of bubbling aspect or <laughs> pits of bubbling acid. <laughs> old rickety wooden bridge and you know uh third aspect might be um tight quarters low ceiling lots of stalagmites you know suddenly we've i described what the environment is but we don't need to come up with specific rules for every these are aspects just like everything else in the game and they could be used to invoke for a bonus or to compel for a problem yep. and that's that's really how the whole game works and remember that aspects are true. So if you're trying to move through zone to zone through a rickety bridge or pits of mud or something, right? It's going to be harder for you to do that. And, you know, you might not have a direct mechanical rule for it, but it just makes sense to the table that, hey, you're probably not going to be able to use, you're probably not going to be able to move from zone to zone with just like the same turn you attack. It'll probably take you another turn to move there because it's going to be harder. Right. Or you might so. say, hey, that big pole arm or great sword you have, is going to be impossible to use or very difficult to use because look, this aspect says the ceiling is really low and there's a lot right. of stalagmites and stalactites. That's not really the environment where one would expect you to be, you know, whipping around a massive greatsword, uh, and so that's going to be a problem for you. And so, the we do it. It's all narrative. It's all descriptive, but it does have a mechanical influence on the game. Um, so those are aspects. So next to aspects are skills, and this is probably the closest analog to most of our traditional D twenty games. Yeah. Um, you basically have skills, uh, traditionally you get one that's really good, two that are pretty great, three that are just fair, and then a couple that are average. And you'll see next to them, it says plus four, plus three, plus two, plus one. That's the bonus that you get to add to your four dice fudge, um, that we, uh, that we talked about earlier, right? So you roll a four dice fudge, you get, uh, a plus one, a plus one, a blank and a minus one. So that's a total of plus one. And then we say, okay, well, what is my character's uh, athletics skill? Well, it's plus two. So I'm adding two to that. So my total value was three. And that's what I'm gonna use to determine whether I was successful or not, whether I critically hit or whether I you know, uh, critically missed. 
So, I think there's something very important to keep in mind when you're thinking of skills and fate, though, and how it differs significantly from your traditional like D20 game. Okay. Um, and we'll talk more about this idea of fiction first later mm. in the stream. But it's important to note that in fate, unlike, you know, so in Pathfinder 2E, you know, you're in combat, right? And you're like, I have this feat, which lets me do this thing. I spend three action or two actions to attack twice or whatever. One of them's agile, so it takes a penalty. So all this is a very prescriptive thing. Like you're you're defining what you want to do with the moves you have available to you, and then the results of those actions are how it plays out in the narrative. And fate, and in, in games where fiction is first, it's kind of the opposite. Yes. So you say what yes. you want to do ultimately, and then you figure out what skill and role or what makes it makes the most sense. For instance, if you're in fate, if you're a archer, right, and you're in combat with a, an orc and your um, you know, paladin is up there, like kind of holding the front line and you're like, I want to shoot this guy with my bow. And as a GM, you might just let him roll attack, right, roll uh, shoot and attack him. But I would actually say, what are you actually trying to do? Are you trying to take this guy out? Are you trying to set up your, you know, rogue or your barbarian or whatever for a like a, an opportunity strike or something? And as an archer, I might say, oh, you know, actually, I don't want to take him out. I want to distract him, right? I want to shoot an arrow at his, you know, at his face and kind of make him like take a take his eyes off of this paladin or this barbarian or whatever. And okay, I say, okay, well, that's not going to be a shoot roll, right? You're going to shoot an arrow and it's going to do what you described, but you're going to roll deceive and you're going right. to roll create an advantage because you're not attack, you're not trying to take this guy out. You're actually wanting to put an aspect on a temporary aspect on him called, I'll say, distracted, right? It's right. a very simple one. And then yeah, we give are. a free invoke to another guy who is this. We'll talk more about this when we get into actions, right. but no, that's, a, that's my, my point is, is that unlike. D20 games, which are very prescriptive, fate is very descriptive. So the exact thing you roll is not going to be set in stone. Like it's kind of up to you guys to figure out what makes the most sense, depending on what you're ultimately trying to do in the narrative. Absolutely. I think that's very important. Yeah. And so like the, the example I always give, uh, this is a Blades in the Dark example, but um, if my care, we're, we're, you know, we're trying to square off against somebody, we're trying to intimidate somebody. And my character says, you know, enough of this. They pull out their flintlock pistol and they shoot somebody in the knee. They kneecap them, you know, to say like, get off our turf, get mm -hmm. gone or you'll be gone. Well, I'm using a gun, but I'm not going to make an attack roll, right? I'm not going to make a shoot roll or ranged roll. No, that's, that's me intimidating. I might be using a gun, but what I'm really doing is intimidating somebody. Right. The gun is description, but... The skill that we're going to use is a form of intimidation. Now, maybe it gets a massive bonus because I'm blowing somebody's kneecap off. But <laughs> but it, the, the, the core concept there is in, in Pathfinder 2 and in other role-playing games, as John said, it's, it's prescriptive, right? The rules tell you what you're supposed to roll. And the narrative kind, kind of doesn't matter <laughs> to a certain extent. You're, you're kind of yeah. just making it up. I mean, a, a great example of this is we've all played games of D&D and Pathfinder 2 that we're essentially role-playing free, uh, right? Like where it was like, uh, well, I'm gonna use an action to move board here. Game. And yeah, you know, it becomes a board game. It is very impossible uh, or very near impossible to do that with fate because it's just yeah. not the way the game works at all. I mean, you um, can do it. It's gonna be very boring. And but like not even, gonna last very long. Yeah, <laughs> it's gonna be way worse. Like in Pathfinder 2, that could be kind of fun because the game is, yeah. is so complex in that way. But in fate, there's very little meat there. The, 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 the yeah. game lives and dies in those descriptions and part of the fun and john i don't know if you agree with me part of the fun for me as a group not just a gm not just a gm but as a group is kind of pausing for a moment pausing the action you know pausing the tape and saying how do we want to resolve this like what do we think yes. would be the best way that should this be a lore role or should it be a rapport role? Because I could see it being either way. And then somebody says, well, like it's really not what you know. It's really the two of you working together on the research project. And it's really more about how well you can work together. And like, yeah, yeah, you're totally right. Let's totally roll rapport instead of lore here. And everybody's like, yeah, okay, awesome. That feels correct. 
And 100%. then you push play and then you make the role. And then we resolve the, the sort of the chance and continue with the fiction. Mm -hmm. yes. I 100% agree with that. Yeah. Um, and what was I going to say? I can put my mind just went bright. So keep, keep going. I'll come sure. back to it once I think of what it was, but that's fine. Um, and so, yeah. And so those are your skills. And the last thing that I want to talk about before we move on to the actions um, is stunts. And I'm not going to get into the details of this, but stunts are basically like feats. <laughs> they yeah. are, they're like kind of, this is a unique thing that my character can do that gives me a bonus kind of for free. Yeah. Is how when I would describe it. In a certain it. circumstance or situation, right. yeah. So, for example, my character might have a stunt that says, when they're driving a car in a high-speed chase, they get a plus two to bonus, right? To drive, yeah. To drive, to, pilot, to drive, whatever, to, to, yeah. or pilot. It's not whenever they're in a car. It's not whenever, it's when they're in a high-speed chase, and it's this particular skill that gets a bonus. It's a, it's a way of sort of saying, my character is kind of always good at this, and it's sort of a unique mechanical advantage that I get in order to kind of carve out a little bit of a niche. Yeah, there's also you can get more interesting stunts as well, where you can like get make them more powerful, but limit them by maybe it takes a fate point to do mm. it, or maybe you can only do it once a session. So stunts are very free form, and and creating stunts just like creating aspects is one of the hardest things. Yes, uh, for a new group. Um, because there, it's not like Pathfinder two, it's not like, here's a list of, you know, 20 general feats, pick one. Uh, right. you know, they have some, I, you know, they give you some like suggestions and examples, but by, by no means is it a list yeah. that you are picking from. In fact, I would argue the vast majority of stunts are custom created. The best and, stunts are going to be custom made for your campaign. Right. And right. Sometimes uh, it's fact, gonna, if, Yeah. I was going to say sometimes it's a great you way. look at like a lot of these books, like interface zero and Doe, what was it? Doe fate and uh uprising and such they all give you a list of like stunts or maybe even art types like with art types and fate is like basically a kind of like the mold a class that you can kind of just get started with quickly but they're basically just ideas right they're, they're meant for you to be like here's some things that might make sense in this world you can pick them directly if you want but it also is very clear that hey you know the best ones are going to be ones you guys craft together that fit the story you're trying to tell. Cause you know, if you're, if you take this a sneak attacker stunt, right. And that, and you don't ever do anything where that's going to come into play, then it's going to feel kind of bad as a player. So it's, it's really best to talk them over with your group and come up with them and you're going to screw up. You're going to make bad stunts, but then you just adjust them as you go. Like, oh, this is a little too powerful. You know, let's, let's tone this down a bit though. So. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, the last thing I want to talk about in terms of how fate works, is talk about actions and outcomes. Now, this is kind of new to Fate Core. Um, we didn't really talk about this too much, but there have been a bunch of versions of Fate. Fate's been around since 2000, um, when it was first kind of made by, by Fred Hicks and Rob Donahue, who sort of the, the, the co-founders of Evil Hat. Um, and it went through several different versions. Uh, I kind of came aware of it during Fate 3, which is like mid 2000s, so 2005, 2006. Um, you know, some games like Spirit of the Century, uh, Bulldogs is one that I, I played um, uh, and kickstarted back in the day. We got Dresden Files RPGs, the Nova the Praxis, which is another Fate game. But uh, and so when John and I were first talking about Fate, we kind of had a little bit of uh, cross wires because some yeah. of the things that I knew about Fate had changed into Fate Core, I think, for the better. Uh, but 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 now Fate Core is sort of the sort of the, the hallmark sort of bedrock of what fate is. Now, that being said, there are uh, a couple different versions of fate. Um, so one version of fate is called fate accelerated. It costs $5 for the book. It is uh freaking 35 pages long. I bring this to every convention I go to. Um, this is the most, this is the quickest and easiest way to introduce role-playing games, period, to anybody mm -hmm. in the history of role-playing games. Um, it is so simple and it is so quick. And Fate Accelerated does not have, you know, the kind of the depth and the complexity that a game like Fate Core has. But it it is it covers all the bases. It gets you there ASAP. Uh, a Fate Accelerated character is, you don't have skills. 
you just have is your character careful, clever, flashy, forceful, quick, or sneak. You get a couple aspects. You write down a couple stunts. You know, when I'm in a sword fight uh, or when I'm in a single combat duel, I get plus two to attack. And that's it. And then you go with that. It's very, very quick, very, very simple. It's very, very easy, and it's very, very cheap. Um, if you are thinking about even getting into Fate uh, and you're not sure you want to spend a lot of money or you just want to try it out, I personally really recommend Fate Accelerated. I think this book is fantastic. I've had a lot of great experience with this. And for $5, it's crazy. Uh, yep. I, Fate Accelerated is, is, like you said, great for getting people who have never played an RPG into RPGs. It's very easy to just pick up and go. It doesn't take very long to create characters. It doesn't, you know, you can just, it, the conventions are great. Yep. You can just jump in and have fun. And, and, and be clear, when I play with some people, I, I mean, I, I just rip mercilessly off of it. I, I go... I go and we make, I make Harry Potter, I make Hermione Granger, mm -hmm. I make Ron Weasley, I make Draco Malfoy, and I go, okay, everybody, you, you know, you're going to go play. Um, you know, is, is Fate Accelerated the rule set whose PDF version is free? Brutus. Good news. All of them are free. Uh, the PDF versions are free and the, uh, oh, technically they're pay what you want, I believe. Sure. Yeah, they are. Um, they are but there's all they're also all available completely for free at fate-srd.com right there is a uh, system resource document just like for ogl there's a yeah, fate except SRD. That it's everything it's the entire book like verbatim is available for free online in the srd unlike dnd's ogl where right. you know you get like a you get some of the classes but yeah. not all of them yeah exactly but yeah it's it, the whole system is entirely free as far as i mean i now, some of this stuff uh, is not, I don't think, include like these these rules. The fate worlds are not. The, yeah, fate, the fate worlds, worlds are not. Are, right. Um, but yeah, uh, 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 Damien, I, I think that's a great point. It says fate accelerated is great for characters who all have similar skill sets, but different approaches. I, I like that, too. I think that's very that makes a lot of sense as well. There's actually a, a hack uh, that became really popular in the fate sphere recently that I think Derek would actually resonate with a bit. And that is uh, they kind of combine approaches and skills. Mm. So you kind of reduce the skill set to because and then you combine them with approaches. So yes. you have a sneaky fight, right? Would be kind of like your sneak. Attack I thing. love that. I mean, 2D20 and, does that and Legend of the Five Rings does that. And I love that approach. Yeah. And it, it I was when I was talking in the discord about maybe trying to figure out how, you know, Legend of the Five Rings would work in fate you were we saying were you, yeah. that port yeah it's actually very natural in that you have your four you know i think they're called aspects in legend of five rings right or uh, the fire earth and all oh, that rings rings yeah the, the five or four or five rings and then you have your skills and you just it works just like legend of the five rings right does, where you add them together right and, so. and 2d20 does the same thing by the way from yeah. uh from indifius um and then damien is saying that some of the fate worlds are even on the srd as well too so when yes. you talk about like hey I, what would i get started with looks like that's for free as well so very free everything's free but of course like i say you know the and people, you don't need fudge dice you can uh, actually play with d6s you can well. do 2d6 minus seven I think is that right? Yeah, yeah. Or you can do one d six minus one d six. Oh, or yeah. you can just roll four d six and change the ones and twos to negatives, twos and threes to blanks. And, right. You don't, I might have the numbers wrong, but you it's don't in, have it's in yeah, the book. You don't have to buy the dice, right? You yeah. you could just use d sixes and say, okay, one and twos are minus one, threes and fours are blanks. I actually used to have. I bought them as like a. Uh, kitschy thing and i used to give them away as souvenirs when i would run fate accelerated at gen con i had these d6s they were a little bit bigger than a normal d6 but they were hollow and transparent but you could see the numbers on the outside of them and then inside that d6 was another d6 so when you rolled <laughs> the one d6 it would actually generate two numbers the outside cool. number and the inside number and i would just say subtract the inside number from that's the outside perfect. number that's yeah uh and that way there was no distinct you know there was no issue no one had to have a word and everybody just had one die in front of them so you would roll it and it would say okay the the, the outside number was a four the inside number was a six that's a minus two um yeah damien williams says you can buy cheap walmart d6s and just sharpie them to make look like pluses and minuses and that works yeah as well. also i found that nowadays you can pretty much buy fate dice I, I see them at like hobby town usa like they're not completely crazy i mean they're 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 a lot the, of the uh, back of the day they were harder Etsy to get dice manufacturers like the people who just make dice themselves and sell them on Etsy they all have them for really cheap too yeah so. exactly I think I think I just still carry I think I carry around my fate dice yep I still have them just right here in my my dice bag nice um 
but it must have the swag. Frosty says part of that. It is, and they have they have some they have some nice fight. Uh, they have uh, they have some nice fate, uh, fudge dice. They have some cool colors. Damien says five sets on to Amazon for ten bucks. Yeah, yeah. very cheap. Super- One thing I want to point out with skills. This is not actually in the book, but this is something I think. I think a, a let's play on YouTube or something where I was watching uh, an actual play or whatever did this and i thought that was a really good idea but basically fate makes these things called i don't have them handy but they're skill cards and they're basically just a card on them that has the name of the skill yeah and on the back it has like examples of what you can do with that skill but what i like to do with them is when i'm in an in-person game and i'm you know having players create their characters i'll lay them all out on a grid on the table and i'll go around the table and say what is your number one skill take it pick it out of the pool and they'll say Okay, I choose stealth, you know, for my character. That is no longer available for a plus four. No one else can have that skill in the group. So it's kind of like a, a niche protection. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, and it's worked really well for me. So no, I like that idea too. That's you actually just, you know, you write them on index cards even. It yeah, sure. I, I love I mean, this is not getting off topic here, but uh I love physical props for mm. character creation and for for even for running games. I mean, uh one of the things I miss the most about VTTs is like being able to hand people uh, a token. Um, you know, even when we play fifth edition D and D in person, it's really important to us and our table that if like my character is helping you and giving you advantage, or if my character casts bless on you and get, is giving you a plus D four that I physically give you one of my dice and that you roll that with your die roll. I don't want you just to pick up two D 20 and roll them. It's like, right. no, no, no here, here, let me borrow, let borrow one of my D twenties. I'm helping you. I'm giving you the advantage. Um, so I like physical stuff. So I love the things like fate points. I've actually played fate on VTTs and it works, you know, it's just, you're not, you don't really need the VTT much, but correct, correct. you know, the camera and stuff is nice, but I've noticed that players often forget they have fate points because they don't have them just sitting in front of them. You know, yeah. they're on off in the corner of their screen somewhere. Or, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's, it, I love Aaron and I talk a lot about the tac- tactile nature of role playing games. And that's something that, you know, again, I get it. VTTs allow us to play games that we would otherwise not be able to play or with people who would never get a chance to play with. But I, I do talk about how the tactile aspect of RPGs is very important. And 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 just having that stack of fate points in front of you, you're like, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm ready to kick ass. And <laughs> like, I, I've paid my dues. Now yeah. it's time for me to, to rock and roll. Um, so we've got our skills. We've got aspects, which we can use our fate points for. You know, we've been taking compels. We've been making our characters' lives difficult. Uh, and for what? So that we could get fate points. And now we're, we're using them to do something and in fate uh and and this kind of gets back to uh to what tiger lemur was asking earlier uh when they asked i'm i'm very early with this question uh but uh, how do you keep fate exciting when there's only essentially four moves or four actions uh and they're not, not wrong- four moves there's four actions <laughs> that's the difference so we were discussing this earlier about how it's a fictional first game but at the end of the day everything essentially maps back to one of these four actions. You are either trying to overcome a challenge or a, a, a an obstacle. You are trying to create an advantage that's going to allow someone else or maybe even you in the future a better chance of succeeding or a better chance at getting a really good success. Or you're attacking something, meaning you're you know trying to, it doesn't necessarily have to be physical, but it means that you are, you know, maybe you're attacking their position. You're you're debating them, right? You're you're trying to uh, take them out. Take you're them out. Take you know, them out of the scene. Take yep. them out of the scene. In a fight, that might be unconscious or bleeding out or dead. In a debate, it means you know you rip them to pieces and they leave the stage crying. You know, yep. uh, or you're defending, which means someone's trying to do that to you, and you're trying to avoid taking uh, any sort of damage or, or issues. And that's it. So, John, why don't you talk us a little bit about the actions and, yeah, and what, so what it relates to? We'll start with overcome and create advantage because attack is really just an overcome when you're trying to take someone out. And defend is more of a reaction, I guess. You right, only you really use it you when never... something else is trying to do something to you. Correct. Um, but overcome is your typical, you know, I'm trying to do a thing. I have to meet some DC to do it. It might be, you know, you're trying to climb... A mountain right you're in this mountain your scale mountain 
or it might be you're trying to wade through a fast paced river or something, right? Um, you're, you're trying to accomplish some goal and there is something that is in your way. Right. We call it an obstacle, but it could be a logical obstacle. It could be a physical obstacle. It could be anything, right? right. This, is, and this is actually really important. In fate, it's very, very, very explicit in that if if there's no if if fail if the possibility of failing an action is not interesting, then don't even bother rolling. Just figure out what happens, decide what happens, and move on. So, I, I think this is yeah, you know, a concept <laughs> that it. It would behoove you to take to other RPGs yes, as well. Exactly. John. But if fate is very upfront about it, be like, listen, you don't waste everyone's time trying to resolve a dice roll. And yep. when failing, if you fail it, nothing can bad is going to happen anyway. So the best advice. So John is 100 percent correct. John, you're 100 percent correct, because the, the, this is I've had this conversation more times than I can count. Someone describes something and this is true for fate. It's true for Blades in the Dark. It's true for Dungeon World. It's really true for Powered by the Apocalypse, but in Dungeon World in particular. Someone will say, but I have such a hard time because somebody did something and I made them roll and they rolled low. They failed. And I sat there and I couldn't think of anything bad that would have happened from their failing. And and they're like, and that's why this game is sucks or this is why I don't like this game. And I always come back with the same answer. I said, then you shouldn't have had them roll. Right, like if you can't think of something uh, that you know made you, uh, oh no, John, we lost you. My, can you still hear me? Yeah, I can still hear you. Yeah, my camera just said the internal temperature is too high and oh. it needs to cool. Okay, well, uh, we'll let it cool off. <laughs> uh, let me see here. Um, keep going though. Uh, Sorry uh, about that. Oh no, hey, listen, it's smooth. See if I just turn it on again, what will happen? Um, you know, I can give it a few minutes. Um, oh, there it is. You're back. Um. So yeah, uh, the uh, the point is, you shouldn't be making dice rolls for just every little thing. In Fate, in Blades in the Dark, in Dungeon World, honestly, even in D20, people do way too many, way too many skill checks. Um, you know, a skill check in one of these games should be a big moment, sort of a uh, uh, kind of a crossing the Rubicon type moment. Like the story is going to go differently here for depending on what we we're going to do, because there's a real chance that we're going to fail or could, could potentially fail. Because one of the things that they added in fate core that was not present in some of these earlier editions of fate is they kind of really included a lot of these sort of, I will say powered by the apocalypse esque success conditions, right? Where now there's a, a a ladder of success. In fact, if you look at it, it kind of looks like the four degrees of success from uh, Very much so. from from Pathfinder Two. Um, but you'll note, by the way, this is how I, I personally, and you might see this in a future battle cry issue. By the way, I wanted to do this already, but after seeing this, I want to do it even more. I want to create a version of Pathfinder Two where you only fail on a critically fail, okay, and where failure is basically what you see here on this with the tie. Right. And Ty says you succeed at the action. We're talking about overcome. You succeed at the action you were attempting, but at a minor cost. So in fate, if you tie the value, you still succeed, but you have to pay a little bit of a cost. But notice if you fail, if you fail it, one option is you fail, overcome. But the other option is you succeed. You just have to pay a great cost. Yep. So even when you fail in fate, you can still succeed. <laughs> so John, why don't yeah, you like, yeah, like talk about that philosophy, that mentality, right? Cause I'm sure a lot of people are, you know, you know me, I did a video, one of our yeah. tops called missing is not fun. And I talk about why I enjoy failure, but what I don't enjoy is like stopping, you know, failure that ends the progression. It's, it's actually challenging. It's another thing that's challenging coming from a D20 is that you, as a GM, you have to be thinking of this stuff. And like, when you ask for a role, you have to kind of have an idea of what the outcomes are ahead of time um, or be willing to think of them on the fly because it's not as simple as you, you succeed or fail unless it's like a defend action, as you see there. Because, And even then, even in a defend action, I will sometimes let them succeed at a minor cost or a great cost if they fail. Like these are kind of this matrix is rules is written. 
nobody follows these exactly every time. Like I keep a cheat sheet of this in front of me and I address it whenever I ask for a role, but I don't always follow it exactly. Like sometimes when it says ask for a success in a minor cost, I'll say that, you know, this makes more sense. They just succeed. Um, you know, just to kind of, the, it's, it's, it's a sliding scale. You can kind of do what you, you want with there. Absolutely. Hey, uh, we're coming up. We just passed through our first hour. So we're going to do our first giveaway. Um, All right. So I'm going to give everybody a few minutes here. Uh, because I'm using YouTube and not Twitch, uh, there's no cool automated prize giveaway. So what I have to do is I have to pick one randomly from uh, the comments. Uh, there's a website that helped me do that. But uh, why don't you go ahead and leave a comment below? Uh, it doesn't really have to say anything in particular, but, you know, say, hey, I want a fate book or, you know, fate book for me or whatever. But go ahead and leave a comment uh, below and uh, once we'll give it a few minutes, we're going to randomly select a winner. And that person is going to win a copy of the, uh, the, the core system of fate, uh, courtesy of, of John. Then we're going to do a second giveaway later in the stream, uh, where John has also provided a copy of the fate system toolkit, which is a, a whole book. It's like the DMG of fate. Yep but it's like really about how to hack it to yourself. And because John mm -hmm. was so generous, I'm gonna be generous. I'm gonna throw in another copy of the Fate Core Rulebook. So our first giveaway is for a copy of the Fate Core Book. And then later in the stream, our second giveaway is gonna be for, uh, you get both. So yep. pretty, pretty, pretty cool. Um, so uh, definitely get, leave a comment in the description, not in the chat, in the description of the video. Um, the YouTube API will not share its chat with stream elements. Uh, so that is why I can't do that, but it, do, it will do the comments. So go ahead, leave a comment. We'll, we'll give it a few minutes and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll make the drawing. Do we want to keep going? While yeah. we... Oh, oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, I'm just gonna leave that up for a little bit there while people do yeah. that. Um, so yeah, so fate is very much a fail forward game. And as a GM, you need to be sitting there thinking about this all the time. And what does that mean? What does failure at a cost mean? And I gotta be honest with you people, that might sound difficult, but there is something incredibly uh, empowering about knowing that there's no way that this dice roll can go bad. You ever been there in a moment in your game where you go, oh my God, if they fail this roll, I don't, I don't know what I, the game, I, it, to me, it's more scary to be playing in a game where like you have hard failure, hard success, and there's nothing yeah. in between. That's what leads people to fudge and to, to cheat on the die rolls and to make up the numbers behind the screen because they go, this is a world, this is a situation where failure is not an option. Well, guess what? Fate gives you that tool because note, even if you fail, you could say, no, you still succeed, but it comes at a great personal cost. And, and if this, if it's an interesting situation to begin with, then it's pretty, usually pretty easy to come up with, you know, a success at a minor cost or a success at a great cost or whatever, because I mean, anything you do really is going to be interesting. Correct. So. Yeah, absolutely. And, and again, I, I think it's, um, you know, I think it's definitely the, the case that it's just, it, it, to me, it's, it's just entirely, it's just so empowering. I just love every aspect of it. Um, nice pun. <laughs> so, uh, what about what about create an advantage? Okay, so this is this is the um, the response to I don't remember who it was who asked the question earlier in the stream about you know you only have four moves. They said uh, this is where the meat and potatoes of fate comes in, in my opinion. So with created advantage, you are essentially creating what they call situation aspects, either on the scene, on a character, whether that's on yourself or an enemy or whatever, on the zone. You can really create a situation aspect on anything. Um, as we'll get into later, pretty much anything in Fate can be a character. Uh, and I know that's something that Derek really wanted to touch on, so we'll, I'm sure we'll get into that. But basically, you can use create an advantage to create a usually it's a temporary aspect but not always um on something and then give that free invoked to someone you can take it yourself someone else can take it when you're you know when your allies or whatever and what this allows you to do is actually very interesting it's something that pathfinder 2 struggles with and pathfinder 2 they have a couple classes 
that are typically seen as more support oriented classes, but people often don't like to play them because they find it hard to feel heroic when you're supporting someone else. But in right. fate, because creating an advantage, you can kind of do whatever you want with it. Like I mentioned, like in the example I gave earlier, where you shoot an arrow at this guy to distract him, you're still doing a cool thing, right? Like maybe instead of shooting the arrow at him to distract him, you're shooting it at his eye to blind him, right? So you're not trying to actually take the character out, but you're trying to do a really cool thing. You're trying to shoot this orc in the eye so that he's now he has an aspect blinded on him that he has to somehow get rid of if he can, if he can manage that. Maybe he's a troll and has regenerative, right? It could, it could feasibly do that. Um, but then you could give that free invoke to the barbarian and you say, next up, I want the barbarian to go next in initiative because in Fate Condensed, you have popcorn initiative as default. Um, oh, okay. I did not know you, that. In Fate Core, the default is notice, but you can also do popcorn if you choose to. But in Fate Condensed, that's one of the things they changed is by default, it's popcorn initiative. But either way, say the barbarian goes next. And they swing this massive attack and they roll really good on it. And they have like three shifts of damage, right? Um, or three shifts of stress. But now they also have this, uh, you know, free invoke they could take advantage of. Now, all of a sudden you have five shifts of stress and that's more than the, the orc can take by himself. So the orc is either going to be taken out in one shot. He's just going to be like hacked in half or he's going to have to take a consequence of some sort where he like, maybe he loses an arm, right? And something like that. And so you could kind of tell these incredible stories without actually fighting the character, you know, like without actually like trying to kill them. You can do these really cool things with creative advantage that really influence the narrative and make you feel like a heroic individual and you're not all competing for the same right. meat, if that makes sense. All right. Well, YouTube sucks and it won't let you comment uh, while we're live. So <laughs> it's just, it's just, it's, listen, YouTube, you're just, you're just begging me to go to Twitch. I'm, I'm telling you, but YouTube is just begging me to go to Twitch. Um, but, uh, you know, the moment I try to be interactive with my chat, they're just shitting on me. Okay. So we have a link in, in chat. There's a link on the page. Um, go to that link, fill out the form, submit, and... And I'll pick a I'll pick a random winner from there. So again, I apologize for this. It's just uh, YouTube is not very good at at doing these sort of interaction things, I guess. And again, so again, I'm gonna get leave that up for a few minutes uh, so people can um, so people can go ahead and uh, and and get get entered into the. Uh, oh, into so it works on PC, just not mobile. That's typical. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, yeah, so app people can't comment. Nice. Okay, well, sorry about that. Well, in order to make it fair, uh, please use please use the link. Um, I'll leave it up there in the description uh, and then go ahead and, and you know fill it out. So we'll wait there till we get some people and then we'll just we'll roll a D20 and we'll just make the decision that way. Um, okay, so as you were saying, you know, these give between, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not kidding when I say this. Overcome is your you know, your basic, uh, I got to jump the pit. I got to swing from the chandelier, right? I got to climb the mountain attack and defend are your, you know, for lack of a better word, it's your strike. Yeah. Create an advantage is literally everything else that you would ever possibly imagine or want to do in a D 20 game. It really yeah. is because everything I knock him prone. Well, you're creating an advantage. I mm -hmm. light him on fire with my magic spell. You're creating an advantage. Everything that you're doing is creating an advantage now in other games you have lists and dozens of feats and things in this game we because we're using words in our aspects we can we can make it do whatever we want it to do and all and the gm if you have the troll monster and you're gonna light it on fire and have it wreathed in your magical flame the gm's gonna pick up that note card and bullet add to a little bullet point and it's gonna say on fire exclamation point exclamation point you put that aspect onto that troll and as a sort of a thank you and thanks for thanks for playing the game uh the gm is also going to kind of put a, a a free fate point there which you can use in order to get some sort of big advantage because the yeah. troll is now on and fire anybody can take that right it's not just vote. you right yeah it's not just you um and so doing things like this way is a great way to sort of get some of those fate point advantages without having to always be shitting on dunking on yourself right? right and so 
uh, I mean, there aren't many things that you can't do without with without just create an advantage because again and it's, it's 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 narrative it's descriptive you can write whatever you want right and and rules is written uh if you're spending a fate point to invoke an aspect you can't spend multiple fate points to invoke the same aspect for the same action but with free invokes from create an advantage you can stack them all you want you know if you have if you succeeded with style creating an advantage and you got two free invokes, uh, now maybe you have another aspect somewhere that also has a free invoke. You can just gobble them all up and say, I want to use all three of those invokes. I want to get a plus six to my roll and I want to just murder this thing. You know, like you can kind of do that. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's so good. <laughs> it really is. Um, and honestly, this is probably my favorite feature of fate like this to really me interesting okay. is what makes fate the most interesting like of course it requires the aspects exist and it requires that you know the idea of fate points exists in general and all that so it has dependencies right yeah but like this is what when i was first learning about fate and when it finally clicked with me like oh this is this is how this game is supposed to be played like this is the thing that was like mind-blowing to me yeah. like you can just do whatever you want and represent it with an aspect and correct now you know and and, and we're gonna do the uh we're gonna do the drawing here in, a, in about four minutes for the first one and we'll do another one at the end um but you know one of the things that i think is important to note here is and and this is just my sense john you can disagree yeah sure uh look you 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 can get advances in fate right you can add new skills you can make your existing skills better Right. Uh, you know, in the case of of Zerd the Arcane, uh, you know, you can see that he doesn't even have any skills that go all the way up to superb plus five. Right. You could add those. Um, you can add more stunts and you can change things. You can increase the number of fate points you start the game with. And there's different options for that. Yeah. But fundamentally, this is, in my opinion, not a game that beholds itself well to playing for two years or one year straight. I think fate is really great at you know, 10, 15, 20 session games, right? Yeah. Where you're, 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 you're kind of trying to, to tell a story and tell an arc and yep, maybe it ends. And then you say, oh, that was fun. Let's do that again. Or let's bring those characters back. But I, I feel like in my general sense is you want it to feel kind of snappy, right? Cause you're not trying to grind the levels like you are in RPG games, right? In most RPG games, technically, everything that you do up until killing the final boss was kind of just a stepping stone to kill the final boss, yeah. right? But you don't really like power up in fate. You get a yeah. little stronger, but you don't really get like super strong. Not so like I agree with you, um, but I do want to point out that fate's progression mod it does have progression sure but it's not as vertical of a progression as like pathfinder 2 so you know you like like derek you said you you can you can get bonuses to your skills and you can get new stunts and things like that but really a lot of your progression is going to be somewhat diagonal or lateral in that you're going to be changing your aspects you're going to be gaining aspects things like that and in some cases that can actually be more powerful than gaining a plus one to your skills absolutely because now say you start out as like um filthy commoner is your aspect right and now all of a sudden later in the campaign you're a hero of the realm well the things you can do as a hero of a realm are going to be a lot different and a lot more expansive than you can do as a you know lowly commoner um so in some degree, in some ways, lateral progression can also be better than vertical progression. So it's yeah. it's an interesting model for sure. Oh, I completely but agree. I agree that long term campaigns typically tend to fizzle out. Yeah, ten to I'm, twenty sessions is probably a good marker. I would I'm, also say one shot sessions are also not great. Yeah, I don't like one shot sessions either. I'll be honest with you. Fate accelerated, I think, can get away with it a lot better. But yeah. um, but I, I think fate is about watching your character grow and develop because you, you really hit on something there that's really important. And I wanna talk about it but right before we do the, the drawing, which is, um, again, in D20, for most, pretty much all the time, the stuff that you've written down about your character and the things that actually happen to your character don't really make that much of a mechanical difference. Right. But in fate, as John was saying, your character is gonna change and that might involve you getting rid 
of some aspects and bringing in a new one. Our character may have started off as the greatest swordsman that ever lived, but then he loses, he, he's bested, his friend gets killed because he wasn't good enough. And maybe we erase that aspect and we put in a new one, right? Like, you know, a broken alcoholic rundown warrior, right? right? Now, everything that we used to use that aspect for is gone. Yeah. And our character has changed in the narrative, but has also now changed mechanically because the things that we're going to be taking compels for and the things that we're going to be invoking for are going to be very different now than that they were at the beginning. And, and I depending think, on how so much cool. you change, it could be an expansion issue or expansion point as well, where like you could have a lot less opportunities to invoke or a lot more opportunities to invoke as well. Exactly. So it's, yes, it's very interesting in that way. All right, we're going to do our first giveaway here, and I'm going to roll this die, and I'm going to count over, and we're going to see who wins. This is a copy of the the core rule book for Fate. There, here we go. All right. All right, it is... It is Chris Jones, uh, Duffy Steel from the Discord. All right, Duffy Steel from the Discord has won our uh first giveaway and since you're in the discord uh duffy steel i will reach out to you after this on, on a pot pm uh if you were a stranger i'd have to get your information but technically i already have your information because you're a member of the Patreon. <laughs> um but i will uh i will make sure that i reach out to you and i will uh i will get you a copy of this we'll we'll send it over to you we'll ship it out to you there hopefully it'll get to you before the new year but uh thank you so much for for uh for filling that out um congrats chris yeah congrats and hey if you haven't already filled out, please go ahead and fill out. I'm going to remove Chris's name from the responses uh, because we're going to do another giveaway, a bigger giveaway. You're going to get a copy of uh, both Fate Core and the Fate Core rule set, uh, uh, tool system toolkit, uh, which is real. If you're a, if you're a geek, you know if you're an RPG geek, that's a, such a fun book. And by the way, Fate has a lot of cool fun books like yeah. that. And I know you know what I'm talking about, John. One of the best things about Fate, or most fun things about Fate, is hacking it to meet your meet your game. Yeah, like and, you can do all yeah. kinds of things really easily in it. So. Yeah, and it is so hackable. Um, it's it's actually kind of crazy how hackable it is. Yeah. Um. All right. Let me remove Chris. I'm thinking of sweetening the deal for the the second giveaway. Oh if, no! If the person is not a, uh, di a Discord member, I was thinking of maybe using my what do you what do you call it in the Discord where you can like bring in a oh henchman hireling uh, henchman yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so. There you go. Hey, well, listen. If you're a hero, the members of Night's Hall, Latin Knights Last Call, you can bring in up to three henchmen yeah. a month. Um, hey, by the way, we haven't really plugged anything because I'm <laughs> bad at this. Um, you know, John is here hanging out with us today because John is a hero tier member of our Knights of the Last Call Patreon. And uh, amongst many benefits from being in our highest tier, uh, John gets the ability, if he's interested and, and uh, willing to do so, to join us. Uh, and hang out with us here and help us do live streams. And, you know, I'm learning a lot from John, um, a lot of things I didn't know about the game, and it's really interesting to hear his point of view. Hopefully you are as well. But if you want to talk to John and you want to talk to me and you want to talk to all these other 260 RPG fanatics, you're going to want to sign up for Knights of Last Call uh, Patreon. That's uh, patreon.com slash Knights of Last Call. There's a link in the description below. We've got links on our YouTube channel. You've heard about it. You've seen it. But it is honestly an incredible community. You get a lot of cool benefits, behind the scenes videos, uh, extra 20, 30, 40 minutes on all of our Pathfinder 2 videos. You get to join us for uh, the after party calls after our APs. There's a lot of really fun benefits to being a member of the Patreon. But I'm not gonna lie and say the, the biggest benefit is honestly being a part of this community, talking with these incredible people. Um, we have had to in a year and three months of the Patreon being active, I've only had to ban one person. And I'm a pretty no-nonsense type guy. Like, I don't care about your money. Like, if you're if you're a dick, goodbye. I'm, I'm just yeah. gonna ban you immediately. Um, I've only had to, had to ban one person. Uh, and so I think it really speaks to the quality and, the, and the, the character of the people that we generate. In fact, Damien and I were discussing the other day, uh, he's been a mod on our live streams pretty much since the beginning. And Damien, uh, 
I, it says I, I don't think he's ever had to, aside from Russian bots, uh, you know, and, and porn spamming has never had to like moderate anybody in chat. We've never had any sort of vitriol or vile people. So really just a positive. I mean, it's a great community, but it's a positive community. And that's what makes it so fun. So it's not an echo chamber either. So you go no. in there. and you know. <laughs> No, it's not. <laughs> we, we definitely disagree at times. And yeah. I think that's OK. People. But, yeah, it's great. Yeah. And, and by the way, no one's sycophantic here. OK, if anybody gets shit on, it's me. I mean, I'm the one who probably <laughs> people say, well, I, I mean, Derek is obviously completely wrong and completely off his, his bonkers. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's such a great, such a great positive community. So, again, um, I'll give you a couple other reminders before we finish up. But keep if you haven't already, there's a link. Uh, in the description uh, and on the page, go to there to the Google form, fill out your name, and we're going to do a drawing at the end of the stream as well for the for the grand prize as well. Um, Damien, but, you mentioned the Fate Horror Toolkit. That's actually the only Fate book I have, or Fate like rule book I have not read. Uh, and also, I think that's one of the ones that's only available as PDF. So I have to check that one out. Got it. Um, yeah. Uh, so let me talk. Uh, so again, I mean, I hate to say it. But that's fate in a nutshell, right? I mean, it's really it literally fits on 60 pages. Yeah, I mean, you... <laughs> it really is as simple as, um, you know, kind of you create a character with um, a couple aspects and the book is very helpful in guiding you to create those. It's a collaborative process. You're going to work with your piece, your fellow PCs. You're going to work with your GM. You're going to tie yourself into the world right from the start of the game. You're going to tie yourself with these other PCs right from the start of the game. John said, uh, there's no meeting in a tavern here. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and if you are meeting in a tavern, it's because you all swore an oath five years ago that you would return and, you know, whatever, uh, and, and, and put a stop to this uh, dastardly villain. You pick some skills. Very simple, very easy, just like any other RPG. And it's very, I, I'll, I'll say this, it's very powerful. You know, in a game where the numbers only range eight points. From minus four to plus four having a skill at plus four is huge i mean that is you basically stepping up and saying yeah i'm like really good at this <laughs> um and then you, you start playing you start using these fate points and it really is an economy you're going to be trading them back and forth with the gm fate points are a way of saying like it, it's like a relay race who's got the baton Right? Who's got the conch? Okay, Lord of the Flies. Um, it, it's my turn to speak. If I have a lot of fate points, okay, it's because my character has a lot of narrative power right now. I can declare a lot of narrative truths. I can pretty not guarantee my success, but I can really give myself a huge leg up on success. I can be very impactful and powerful, but it naturally erodes. And that means it's going to be another character's time to shine. And this ebb and flow, the shifting of these fate points in a game creates just this natural flow of tension, this natural flow of spotlight from character A to character B to character C. And because one of the main ways that you earn these fate points is through compels and bad things happening to you, um, when, your when the going gets rough on your character, or the, you know, the going gets tough or whatever, the tough get going. The more bad things that happen to your character, that typically means you're 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 primed to be awesome and to have an yeah, incredible you're, you're ready to lay down the hammer on something. Exactly. Sure. And 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 long story short, but like that to me is what makes this end up feeling like a TV show or mm -hmm. like a movie. So 100 percent With that in mind, um let's talk about what fate isn't good for. It's not a tactical minis game. Not at all. Not, not at all. great for dungeon crawls. It's not great. No. <laughs> no, no. It's not great for dungeon crawls. Um, it, you know, if you just want to hack and slash, it's going to get boring really mm -hmm. quick. You know, um, in fact, rules is written. Equipment is hand waved. Money is hand waved. Mm. Like you have a resources skill and you're just assumed to have everything you need to do your job. So it's like there are in a fate systems toolkit and some other literature and whatnot, there are ways you can add varying degrees of like equipment crunch and money crunch and stuff in there but by and large it's not a game about inventory management it's not a game about collecting loot things like that so uh so 
Um, yeah, I would say though, and, and you know, if you get good with the game, if money is something that is important to your game, right? You could do something like, uh, you could have it be a stress track. Uh, exactly. you could have it be, uh, you could cut, you could put custom skills into your game, right? Like if your game is very, very political and has a lot of different, it's mostly social, maybe instead of just having rapport, you have like six different social skills because you really want different people to have different edges and different niches. And instead there's just one skill that says like physical stuff, right? <laughs> because it's not as important in our, your game. You can customize the game mechanics to whatever you need to do. So if you want money to be important, because maybe your game is all about being a mercenary and, and, you know, taking jobs and trying to make bank the game, especially the toolkit, which we're about to give away, uh, helps you understand how you can add aspects and stress tracks and uh, stunts and unique skill trees that will all help sort of support that near. But if it's not important and you don't care about how many fucking arrows somebody has, then don't track it. Yep. Yeah. And I would also say that fate is kind of probably not great at um, a grittier game. Mm -hmm. it, it, it it's cinematic, right? Like yeah, these are it's the very much big damn heroes, big damn heroes, over the top, like yeah. big flashy moves kind of deal. Right? Yeah, yeah. These are these aren't just you know the, these people aren't slipping on banana peels, <laughs> yeah. right? Like there's not going to be that moment where like you know you roll a one and it's womp 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 womp. Like when your character fails, it might be in a compelling moment where you go, you know, your character's escaping. And it's not like, oh, you failed your stealth check because you you know slipped on a banana peel. It's right. because you were walking through and then suddenly you spied out of the corner of your eye the king's jewel. And you know, you never you can never say Your greed no. Yeah, yeah. You. you you can never say no to a free payday, right? Yeah. And so like you go That's a good aspect. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you know, right. <laughs> you know what? I'm gonna go try to steal that. You know, I didn't fail the stealth roll because my character sucks at stealth. I failed because my character was, you know, distracted by the gem or, or saw the prince and he was so beautiful. It took my breath away and I, I had to meet him. Like it was a clean break. We were going to get out of the masquerade ball. No problem. But then the prince took off his mask and I saw how beautiful he was. And I said, I, I need him. I need to meet him. You know, I need to meet him. And so right. that is the game is very much more about these competent characters who through their own, like through their faults and their personality and their drives and their ambitions, those are the metrics by which they succeed or which they fail. It's a very, very personality driven game. Uh, and, and honestly, you know, the PCs are at the, the, the heart of it. I mean, the PCs in, in D20 games can sometimes feel like they're not the stars of the show, right? Mm -hmm. Like other cooler, bigger, more important characters are doing stuff and the PCs are kind of just trying to stop them. Right. Right. The PCs are like that person where you go, where do you want to go to eat? And they go, I don't know. And then you say, well, how about, <laughs> how, how about Olive Garden? They go, no. And you go, well, okay. How about Texas Roadhouse? No. Right. The PCs are, the PCs aren't doing anything. They're stopping cooler people from doing stuff. Right. But in fate, you are the protagonist. And that means that the players have to be willing to step up. The GM is sharing that narrative load with you. And fate and, falls apart very quickly if everyone at the table isn't engaged with telling the story. Like if, if you just try to leave everything up to the GM, yeah. you're probably not going to have as good of a time as you, you could. So we got, um, a, we got a great question from Frosty. Uh, how does fate deal with dying or death? Yes. So that's actually Damien is is correct there. But to elaborate on that, uh, and I kind of alluded to this a little bit earlier Basically, in fate, you can't die unless you do something really stupid. And what I mean by that is anytime you're in a conflict, which conflict is what you call, whether it's a physical, trying to take someone out physically, like kill them or whatever, or take someone out socially, which we'll get into shortly. We didn't really touch on that either. You can have social conflicts as well. Um, but if you are, you know, re recognize that your character is really getting ready to bite the dust, you as a player at any time during the conflict can say, I concede. And you are 
taken out of the conflict. You can narratively de describe how that maybe you're, you know, unconscious against a tree or something, right? You can, you can kind of, or maybe you d decided this wasn't for you and you ran and hid somewhere. Like it's up to you as the player to describe how you exit the scene, but you don't have to die. Like you can say that is your way out. Now, if you don't concede and you receive an attack that you cannot absorb with either stress or consequences, then it is up to the GM how you exit the seat. It, you it, lose all narrative control. There. Right. In PBA terms, uh, you know, I brought up the character sheet so you can see that you have a physical stress box and a mental stress box. So when your character is taking damage or falling or doing something that's going to hurt their physical body, you're going to mark those physical stress boxes. Now, you, you start with two, but you can get up to four. And you have another set of boxes for mental stress, fear, anxiety, uh, embarrassment, right? I mean, it could be anything. Now, when you take damage or you take mental damage or you take physical damage or stress, it's called, you can either mark those boxes or you can take one of those consequences, mild, moderate, or severe. And you can see here on the, uh, on the sheet uh, that the consequences sort of absorb a certain amount of points of damage. So if I take a severe consequence, that is going to absorb or eat up six points of damage. So like if I take a massive critical type hit from a massive, you know, a bomb goes off near me and I don't have the physical stress boxes to do that, I could take that severe consequence, which might right. say badly burned, you know, or, you know, disoriented legs shattered right there's it's all narrative you know it's yeah. descriptive the general idea is that severe consequences are really they're, they're not permanent but they're harder to get rid of you normally have to spend effort and get medical care to actually get rid of those consequences yeah and you, moderate you, consequences usually last like a session or more you know and mild consequences usually just last the scene and, and you can stress goes away at the end of the scene so if you if you know at the end of the scene right. the conflict you have your you know you made it through with just one one stress box left that's gone at the next scene so right so so stress boxes on your character sheet those are like your shields in halo right they yeah. just come right back at the end of the scene so if you can just absorb things using your stress, you're you're probably pretty good for it. It's when you take these big blows that you can't take, or if you're just taking a ton of stress, that you're going to have to tick these consequences. And as John was saying here on our cheat sheet, by the way, this cheat sheet really is just everything you need to play the game. Um, <laughs> yeah, it is. You can see here in the bottom, in the bottom right, it says recovery, and it says a mild takes about a scene, a moderate takes about a session, and a severe takes the whole scenario. Like, that could last for the whole adventure. Um, and they don't we don't talk about it, but you also notice that in consequences, there's even an extreme consequence, which uh, takes eight points off. But uh, you have to change one of your aspects. Like your that's like how you would represent like missing an arm or missing right. a leg. Right. Like you you would or or like or maybe it's a mental thing, and mm -hmm. your character went from being like lighthearted and always sees the best of things, and now they're cynical and depressed. Right. Or like, maybe it's a good way to represent like an innate fear they have. Like right. Exactly. Um, but to your point about conceding, your character at any time could say, you know what? Yep, they take me prisoner. You know what? Yep, uh, I, I flee the scene. You know what? Yep. But if you go all the way to the end, it becomes almost like a hard move in PBTA terms. The GM doesn't, you, you used to get to make that call. But if you take too many consequences and you stay in the fight because you think it's worth fighting for and you get to the end and you've used up all of your boxes and all your stress and you get taken out, then the game master gets to decide your fate. And they might decide, to be fair, by the way, you could decide to leave the scene and say, I die. <laughs> like if you yeah. think if you think that's the appropriate way for your character to go out, I mean, that's totally reasonable. But technically, if you go that far, so in a sense, you as a player get to decide, is this something that I am willing to fight for or, or, or sacrifice enough for that I'm willing to put my character's fate, well, into the hands <laughs> of the GM and let them decide what happens to me, which could be up to and including death. Yeah. yeah. Now, as a GM, I will say I typically, I very rarely employ the death card uh, with this. And, and in fact, it yeah, very sure. rarely comes up where I have to make this call in the first place. Most time people can see yeah. because they, they don't want to take that risk. Yeah. Um, I think I've maybe killed a PC once because it, it made the most narrative sense. They had already 
lost an arm and lost a leg and they're bleeding. I mean, it was it, their body was already extremely battered from this combat. Um, most of the time I will capture them. I will do something like, you know, that, because in my opinion, death more often than not, death is the least interesting thing that can happen. Yeah, absolutely. So yep. We say that all so, the time. I mean, it, it yeah. you know, and, and again, this is, this isn't, this isn't a Gygaxian dungeon from 1978. You're not right. falling into a pit and then having your body eaten by rats. I mean, that's a fine style of game. I've got old school essentials right behind me, ready to be right. open. And <laughs> like, like that game is awesome for that. But like, you know, you're going to spend an entire session, three or four hours with your friends or your, or your companions creating these characters, lovingly crafting their aspects, envisioning these ideas for them. It's not the game that you just kind of, ball up the character sheet and throw it away and start over again, right? It It is a game that it rewards you for investing in your character because the game doesn't want you to die either. And right. in this case, you know, this is like your superhero movie. They're dead. Oh, no. They they survived the fall off the waterfall. They they pulled themselves free of the collapsing rubble of the building, right? It, it, it's a game where it's always more fun, I think, to kind of come back. And yeah, the more over the top the toy is a story is you're trying to tell, like superheroes or anime or things like that. Those yeah. are the kind of things that fate really shines because you can represent a lot of these things that are just so absurd yep. so easily. And Brutus said fate just seems like such a fun system for a superhero focused game. And that is now I've run fate accelerate edition. I've run it at Gen Con and stuff like that a bunch. But my one game that I played with, you know, some of the knights that, you know, Tim, uh, Aaron, this is before Bob even joined our group, but we ran, uh, we had been playing superhero games for many, many years using mutants and masterminds. And then we decided to do uh, volume four, season four of our mutants and masterminds chronicle of the Lake Erie League. We used fate. And this is where I learned a lot about fate. This was my first time playing it as a whole campaign. I think mm -hmm. we did about 16 issues of, of Lake Erie Leagues in a, not, an alternate universe, 1980s, where Cleveland, of course, was the biggest city in the world. Um, <laughs> uh, and this was uh, this was with Blue Barracuda, uh, Tony Rigatoni, and uh, all these other. But anyways, Sounds like a dangerous world. That's very dangerous world. Um, <laughs> and uh, it was incredible. It was a lot of fun. But I did learn two important things. One, I talked about one of these earlier. I don't want to name names, but I'm going to name names. Matt Holloway, you know him, you love him, Burl. Uh, Matt Holloway, when he played Fate, um, he was very much in the this is a game mentality. Why would I want something bad to happen to my character? That doesn't make any sense. Like he was about to escape. And I said, do you escape or do you stay behind? To, you know, to, I offering him a nah, I'm good. I'll leave. He because he was trying to and I don't you know, I, I think this is a natural understanding because he was trying to beat the game. Yeah he did not really accept compels. And that was a problem. It meant that he ran out of fate points. It meant that it was hard for him to do things later on. There's sort of a natural progression. So that's one thing. The second thing is, you know, a fate game is going to, it's going to test your creative juices as a player and as a GM a lot more than maybe just, uh, to be fair, D&D should be a creative endeavor, but let's face yeah. it, a lot of times it's not. Right. It's all right. Well, initiative, like said, role initiative. Game <laughs> yeah. Whatever. And you can always fall back on that. You know, like D and D can still be exciting sometimes. Like, sure. We're role playing. Sometimes we're doing the fluffy bullshit time. We're really leaning into it. But sometimes you're like, okay, we're just going to throw dice. And you know, fate really struggles with that. If you have a group yeah. that has no interest in, in being part of the storytelling experience and, and they're just expecting it to be like Netflix and they're just going to watch the GM tell them a story. Fate's going to struggle. Gonna fall apart. Now, yeah. that doesn't mean you shouldn't try it because, no, no, you know, maybe that's how you break them out of that and yeah. you encourage them. But it, it you know, and, and I guess the third thing I would say is this, and this was not a problem for me, but I did notice it, which is uh, if you're a control freak GM, <laughs> not not a good system for that. I mean, players really Correct. do have a lot of uh, a lot of power. Uh, oh, Chris Jones just caught up on 2x speed and uh, saw that they won the CRB. Yeah, uh, yeah, Chris, awesome. Congrats, uh, dude. I will, I will be DMing you in Discord and I'll get your information. I'll get that shipped out to you like Monday morning. Um, Advice I can give anyone who wants to try Fate but comes from a more D20 background or really any other RPG background, uh, forget everything you know about RPGs 
and approach it with a fresh perspective and an open mind and you'll probably pick it up a lot easier than trying to like because I, I when i first learned it i came from a d20 background and i very much was banging my head against the wall at first mm. trying to you know make the make it work because i was trying to play it as a as if i was playing these games i was used to and once it finally clicked every, i remember at the table all of us kind of clicked first at the same time and we always looked at each other and i'm just like this is how this game is supposed to be played and it really does become a really awesome experience once you do that. Yeah, I mean, I, I said this about I've said this about Powered by the Apocalypse. I've said this about Legend of the Five Rings. I've said this about Blades in the Dark. Um, if you try to play these games like a D20 game, you're going to come away being disappointed. And mm -hmm. it's so it's so funny to me because I look at the way that so many people are playing especially their 5th edition D&D &D games. Mm -hmm. Like I look at Critical Role and I go, "Why the fuck aren't they playing Fate?" Yeah, right. like this is like this is everything that they want. Yeah, like it is a it is a character driven cinematic experience. Yeah, it's it's an education thing. I mean, I really do think so. I think you know, Critical Role chose Five E for reasons, right? And one of those is probably I speculate is because mm. they wanted the hotness. Yeah, right? of course. I mean, everybody knows D and D, right? Who knows fate? Yeah. And I think that kind of had a snowball effect. And I think now with all the one D and D stuff, I know in the fate Reddit, we're seeing a lot of people come over from five E interesting. A lot of them are interestingly trying to inject their five E, you know, uh, ways into this and they're finding it's not working. And it's, yeah. you know, once they realize how it's supposed to be played, they're like, Oh, wow, I should have been playing this all along. This is exactly what I want. Right. Um, but like you said, it's not good for everything. It is not a silver bullet. It is, um, you know, it's not great for nitty gritty games. It's not great for dungeon crawls. Right. It's not great where, for games where combat is the focus. Like, right. And you mentioned before nitty gritty, like if you like lots of minutia and lots of little details and tracking a ton of numbers and picking a bunch of feats and mechanics, like I said before, in terms of progression, you know, your character will change, but you know, uh, fundamentally, you know, the beginning of the Avengers at the beginning of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, Captain America, you know, he was who he was, and at the end, he was who he was, right? Like they don't, mm -hmm. they don't change that much. Like they, they, right. they might, their viewpoints might change, their personalities might change, but you don't have the the zero to superhero progression right. that you would have in your standard D twenty game. Your character starts off pretty damn competent, and they might get a little bit more, you know, nuanced and and refined, but they're not going to like become a demigod or a deity right like through the natural progression of play like if in your campaign everybody uh like literally i don't know went to the star stone and ascended you know the gm might give you a new aspect which is like unlimited cosmic power and you're like <laughs> okay like cool like we could do stuff with this um but you know it, it it is not for every fantasy it's not for every type of genre and story but if you want that kind of if you want the critical role type game if you want the movie tv experience if you want the comic book experience in your your game and you want to be able to just go wouldn't it be cool if this just worked you're like yeah it would be uh, here's a fate point it does you're like oh shit that's awesome then this is the game that you got to play right i always thought the perfect movie to represent what fate could be is guardians of the galaxy okay that's like if you look at that, it's, it's it's a lot of humor. It's a lot of fun action. It's a lot of over the topness, like sure. completely absurd bullshit. But it's also a lot of failing, but all along with the success. If you, I mean, if you look at the Guardian Galaxy, especially Guardian Galaxy One, the number of times Quill fails, like in that movie, compared to the number of times he actually succeeds at something, is the ratio is quite skewed, right? Right. And that's kind of what I think. A perfect fate game kind of no uh, uh, that is so because, because here's the thing when we watch tvs and movies we watch characters we watch people go through the hero's journey what do we see we see them fail a bunch and then succeed when it's big and that's like the opposite of almost everybody's DD experience you succeed all the time and then you fail one time and that's it yeah. it's over right it's a tpk you roll a hero point yeah, and, you're no longer and, <laughs> and your character's dead and that's it like it's the end of the story so it's like this really weird reversal where you know in a D, &D story it's expected that your character is going to succeed 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 and then when you fail it means either like the the, the adventure can't continue or your character just died 
But in movies and in TV and in books, it's the opposite. Characters usually suffer through a number of setbacks and a number of trials and tribulations, and they have to think on their feet and come up with alternate means. But all the while, they're getting stronger and better. You know, I always point out that, like, in the movie Die Hard, by the end of the movie, uh, you know, McLean should have, like, he should be like, have nothing left. He should be the weakest he's ever been, but that's when he right. wins because you're like, but he's bloodied. He's beaten up. He's destroyed. Yeah. But he's got a stack of fate points, fate points. <laughs> about a mile high. And he's just yeah. like, just, he's just throwing them. He's just, he's splashing his chips. Like he's the big he's man at the poker in. table. Yeah. He's just all in. In fact, we had a joke when we used to play fate and when we used to play mutes and masterminds, which uses hero points, which are kind of similar to fate points. Um, the idea is you spend one point, but Aaron, you know Smith uh, from from our from our from our Patreon and from our Discord and from our show, a uh, good friend of mine. Aaron would sometimes he would say, "Derek," and he would reach down and he would like slide forward a stack of like two or three fate points or hero points because he knew what he was about to ask was <laughs> so outrageous. Because just like we said before, like compels are a way of the GM bribing the player to do something that's more interesting. You could think of it as fate points are kind of a way of the player bribing the GM yeah, exactly. and being like, I think it would be awesome if, what if it turns out that this person is actually my long lost daughter, you know, and slides it forward and it's like, oh, hell yeah, I'll take your bribe, I'll take your money. Yeah. Um, and it's so fun because like the players know, man, I, I did that, I made that. That was my contribution to the story. Um, yeah, it's it's very like uh, to saw someone in the chat say that you know it's one of the hardest things is accepting failure. Let's see, let me find the exact comment. One second. Yeah, uh, I lost it in the sea of comments. They're they're basically saying that um, they think the hardest thing coming from five E oh, is, is having to it. accept failure, and I one hundred percent agree with that. Yeah, um, and because you're triggered to be like failure means adventure over. It means we don't. I'm dead. It means TPK. Right. It means end of the line, right? We 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 were conditioned to that. Yeah, and it's unfortunate because, yeah, like I said, if you play the if you play Fate how it's intended to be played, it is an incredible experience. And I think that that hurdle that so many people, including myself, had to go through to really figure it out is is sad because, like, I feel like so many people are probably not giving it a second chance after they have that bad experience. Yes. And, and I've seen that with Powered by the Apocalypse games. I've seen that with, uh, you know, Blades in the Dark, where people play it and they, and they, they the GM might mess it up by playing it too much mm -hmm. like D&D. &D. Uh, the players don't lean in and they're, they're afraid to be compelled. They're afraid to create problems because you're used to the problems be, are bad. Problems are what we are trying to avoid, right? Right. We want our characters to just win, 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 because the consequences of failure in D and D are so high, right? And 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 so rightfully so, you're you're afraid of those consequences, right? Yeah, I mean D and D, and I know people always say it's not about winning or losing, but in in the end, it kind of is because absolutely you fail, absolutely. you lose, like <laughs> you die, you make a new character, or, or you drop out of the campaign. So, you know, with fate, I I go back to that quote I mentioned at the beginning where it's not about succeeding or failing it's about looking cool doing it. I think that's yeah. really the mantra if you're going into fate, how you should think of it. Absolutely. Um, and yeah, because, you know, one of the, one of the problems I have with modern D 20 games, and this includes Pathfinder two is they have created a system, you know, the original D and D system I hate was pretty agnostic. It mm -hmm. didn't, it, it, here are the rules. Here's a creature's armor class. Here's its hit points. Here's your hit points. Here's your armor class. And you know what? I don't care what happens. Uh, you know, I, these rules aren't created to try to create a certain type of experience. They just right. are our basic attempt to try to model this reality. And you're like, oh, I made this cool fighter and I get, okay, well, the goblin stabbed you and it, it did five damage. And you're dead. Oh, okay. All right. I guess I'm dead. <laughs> and so. It's simulationist, yeah, right? Yeah, right. Very, very simulation. Fifty years later, we're still playing that game, yeah. but but they've changed the, the rules. Behind it has changed. Yeah, and people don't want that anymore. But they didn't change the rules. 
So what they did instead is they like changed the math. And now it's like, oh, you're dying. You're dying three. You're dying four, but you took the die hard <laughs> feet. So you're not dead yet. Oh, you went to dying five. You're dead, but you smashed all your hero points. It's like, why are we going through this rigmarole? What you're trying to do through all these hoops is just have a fate experience. Yeah. And that's like you mentioned it before, like critical role. A lot of these five you people like fate would be perfect for them because that's this is literally what they're trying to do. Yeah. And, and not even just necessarily fate. Right. A lot of these other narrative first RPGs could work just as well. And, you know, there's a whole bunch of them they could choose fun from yeah. and find the one that fits them best. So well, it's, it's really unfortunate. But. It is. And, and I think the key thing that separates fate from Dungeon World and uh, Powered by the Apocalypse games, including Blades in the Dark, what separates fate is this idea of that fate point economy that you mm -hmm. called it, John. And it's the idea that, because in, in Blades in the Dark, the game is set up so that the dice rolls are interesting and that something's going to happen. But at the end of the day in Blades in the Dark, you don't have that same power of mm -hmm. narrative control to come in and just say, I'm declaring a narrative truth. I'm going to spend one of my currency points. Blades in the Dark and Powered by the Apocalypse don't have anything like fate points or hero points. Right. That is something that is pretty unique to fate. Um, you know, even games that sort of have like bennies or hero points like Pathfinder 2 or, or Savage Worlds, they're more of like a reroll. Yeah. Which fate has. But it's that kind of, but it, but that ability to say, well, no, um, my character, you know, your your character visits the Collegial Arcana, and your character is obviously a part of the Collegial Arcana, and you're like, oh, well, my character knows where there's a secret room of requirement, like from Harry Potter, right. and I, I used to hang out there when I was a kid and bullied when I went to school here. Boop, you drop a fate point. It's true. Mm -hmm. Right, and now your characters can go hide in the, and you know, you're you're just pulling from every other genre and movie and TV show that you've ever seen. You're like, you explain it to everybody. It's, you know, like the rumor requirement from Harry Potter. It's like that, but in and, the in the wizarding school that I went to. And, yeah, and, and everyone else at the table has a chance to say, no, nah, that's, 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 that's too much. That's, right. you know, but, we don't want you to do that. But the game you is- make your case. You yeah, know. you make your case, but ultimately, you know, cause again, you know, oh, uh, I think, uh, I think we find them and they're all dead. It's like, okay, no, like there's a, there's a great line in, I think it's in Torchbearer where it says like, no reaching. And it goes, you know what we mean? It's when somebody is trying to pull the bullshit their way out of something mm -hmm. and everybody knows that this is totally garbage. It's like, just stop and sit down and stop. Like you're, you're hurting it. But I think the game to your point, John, if you have people that you trust that are gonna make the game more fun, like there might be a, a, a knee jerk reaction to wanna say like, no, that's not true. But it's more fun if you say yes. Yeah. And let's or go. yes, but. Yeah. You know, and let's go with it, right? Let's keep yeah. going with it. It's like, yeah, you did find the room of requirement and there's someone else in it, you know? And it's like, it's it's interesting and it, it continues to spiral. And having the players be able to be active, you want to talk about people not paying attention because it's 30 minutes to their next turn, right? In Fate, like the characters are you literally, have that problem. yeah, they're literally writing the game as they happen. Now, I get it. That's not what everybody wants out of a role playing game. Yeah, it's it's very hands on. It's very uh, I get to be an author of my own story, and that can be very intimidating for some people. But yeah. for but for these critical role types who have a story to tell and have a voice to tell it, I can't think of a better system. <laughs> I know, right? I, it's wild to me. It really is wild to me. Critical role, take notes. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I just I don't. I don't get it. I really don't get it. Uh, why they don't. I mean, it's, it's, it's marketing, right? I mean, so I, know, back, I know. So back in like 2012, when 13, something like that, when fake core, like fake four and fake core became entered the, into the industry. Um, it actually won a bunch of awards at the indie game, whatever the indie TTRPG award show is that happens once a year. I what it's like indie game developers conference i don't remember but anyway it won a bunch of awards and it was like considered for a few years to be like the the indie darling of the ttrpg thing. oh it was it was i mean i think powered and, by the apocalypse kind of took over it yeah but. that was the same and then like pbta <laughs> and dungeon world and uh blaze in the dark those since then those have kind of you know taken the place there so i think I would be surprised if like Critical Role didn't look at some of these other games and be like, these are probably a better fit for what we're trying to do. But they probably were like, D&D's got such a name behind it. We yeah. can kind of piggyback off their marketing. So 
I get it, you know. Yeah. Um Anthony says they can't open the link. Anthony, oh no. Oh no. Uh, but he says I already have faith. So okay. Well, fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um let's see. That works for me. Um all right. Well, we're we're here at seven o'clock. So I think we're gonna do this final giveaway. Um, before we wrap up, uh, is there any other questions that you want to ask? Um, yeah, we never really did a, I mean, you know, people, people were kind of, I think, throwing yeah. questions out there uh, in the past. I see that, uh, Menandrea says, I can see why Derek, uh, recommended this game to me in the past. It's definitely something I, I think I might try, try out. Uh, a lot of people, some frost Jack is saying, account me as interested if someone wants to try a community game. I mean, a big part of being part of the night's last call is being exposed to different games and finding things that you like. Um, in fact, you know, we, we were talking uh, a little bit about how there's sort of a, there's a, what'd you call it? Fate in the dark? Oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> so a while back on Reddit, I saw someone post about a, a fate hack they did called Fate in the Dark, where it took some of the things from Blaze in the Dark, like position and effect and things like that, and kind of massaged them into a fate-centric model and yeah. injected them. I haven't read through it yet, so I don't know how good it is, but the comments were very positive for it. So yeah. I, I need to go back and find that and look through it again but hey we had a 10 pound super chat from uh from cybersmith cybersmith said how do you avoid someone and this is a great question john i'd, I'd love to hear yeah. your answer how do you avoid someone accidentally spending a fate point on something useless like fate point i was carrying a silver crucifix but they were wrong about the enemy being a vampire um so first of all if they were wrong about the enemy being a vampire uh as a GM, I might consider making the enemy a vampire, depending <laughs> on if they, you know whether it's been canonized or not. Right. Um, but how to? It's a good question, and it, it's really no like one size fit all answer. Sometimes I would say, let them like talk it over with them. Sometimes I would right. say, just let it happen. I mean, yeah. it, they it's definitely possible just that they could make a mistake. You know, Maybe, like I said, failing isn't just about failing in dice rolls. It's also about making poor decisions right yep um so depending on the situation and how critical that i felt that particular decision was i would approach it differently but there's no like hard bake rule or one size fit all ruling for that yeah so I, I i kind of agree with john so the first thing i would say is for for, for starters like john said certain um npcs or scenes can have aspects that are hidden to your character like your character uh, you know, it's, it's not it's not full. Everybody, the place PCs know everything. Uh, a, a creature could have aspects that are unknown to you, and you can make action rolls to try to determine what those aspects are. So maybe the character has an aspect. I am a vampire, yeah. uh, and you can try to determine that. But going back to what you said before, uh, first things first. Let's say my character is a vampire hunter, and they have an aspect that says like, you know, been hunting, been hunting vampires my whole damn life. You know. I might go into a scene and maybe there's a character who maybe isn't actually a vampire, <laughs> but I say to the group and to John, my, my GM, uh, I'm going to spend a fate point. I am going to declare a narrative truth. I've been hunting vampires my whole damn life. And I know one when I see one, I can smell it. And that guy is a vampire. And I kind of like, yeah. I kind of, what I like to do a lot of times in the game is I kind of do like a, like a nudge, nudge, wink, wink to everybody. And then everybody kind of silently nods their head like, yeah. And then they, when the GM accepts the point, I assume, like we don't have to discuss it. It's kind of like a, like a, a, a an unspoken rule. Now we've established, yeah, okay, the GM, he, maybe he wasn't, but he is now. He is now, yeah. <laughs> and, and that's really, really fun. And you're like, okay, great. Silver crucifix, you know, talk spawn of Satan and, you know, go to it. And like, that is, um, yeah, Anthony says LMAO. Use a fate point to make them a vampire. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, if if it make if it like if it's it, something that you think right. would be cool, nothing and, like, play out in an interesting way, then hell yeah. Right. So that's the first step. The second step is I would say refund it. You know, like it, you know, you want it to be fun. Like maybe someone misread it or did something or whatever right. like that. I think you ultimately are going to do what's best for your group and what you're. But you're not trying to win here you're not trying to like screw them over and be like ha 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 i totally made you think he was a vampire because he didn't like garlic on his pizza and then i made you waste fate points it's not like yeah. that like it's not like that so um, i would also say as a player i probably wouldn't make that declaration until i knew he was a vampire right if i didn't know he was a vampire i probably wouldn't try to do that i would first try to figure out if he's a vampire 
with like an overcome role or something. Right. And if you were, if you had the aspect, you know, experienced vampire hunter or something, you might then invoke it to get a, plus, have a bonus, plus two to, bonus that to that probably succeed in figuring yep. that out. Yep. Ex- absolutely. Um, hell you might even have a stunt. Correct me if I'm wrong, John, that says like, I could detect the presence of undead. Sure. You said once per session, I can, t- I can determine whether someone is undead or not. Right. Or exactly. Like that. Exactly. And so you could just cash that in. Uh, I like Anthony says, you can't make him a vampire. That'll ruin my story. And that's what I meant. <laughs> that's what I talked about. Like you, you just, you, you gotta, you gotta be hands off. You just gotta let it slide because if you're really going to lean into this and you're going to let your players have that kind of narrative control, then your GMs, you know, I always like to say this. I've said this for a long time. The story that is small enough and pathetic enough that it can fit and live inside the mind of just one person is not a story that I want to have at my role playing game. I want a story that could only exist because we are all contributing, mm-hmm. you know, and I don't want the story that's mine. I want the star- story that's ours. And I, I think that's really, you know, sort of the, the gateway for it. All right. We are going to do our final giveaway. Uh, last chance to get to those forms and we will, uh, I'm going to head over there right now. Okay. We got about, we got about 20 responses. Um, so I'm going to roll a D20 and, uh, I got my big D20, but that won't really do us any good, but this one, uh, there was a question further up. Uh, we had already answered early in the stream, but I think that, uh, go ahead you can roll. No, no, no. I'll let people have a last chance minute to, to get their, uh, to get their things in. What was the question? Um, the question was about whether there's a default setting or genre. For oh, fate. we'd I, answered it earlier in the stream, but this particular person came in later. Got it. So I was just going to reiterate that yep. no, there is no default setting or genre because a big component of fate is coming up with that kind of stuff with your group. That said, there are a lot of third party games that are based on fate that do provide a default setting or and or genre to kind of help you get started and. You know, for a group that is coming into fate for the first time and may not be very experienced, I think starting with something like that is a great way to go about it because it kind of takes a lot of the burden off of your table. All right, here we go. Rolling the D20. We got a 13. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. All right, our winner is unfortunate pumpkin oh he already owns all the books <laughs> damn it unfortunate pumpkin why did you enter for <laughs> but hey listen uh uh everybody everybody's a everybody's a free winner uh, everybody gets an enter so um unfortunate pumpkin uh you are the winner of the uh, uh penguin you're right we should just call him that um rigged <laughs> we got these two um, and, uh, because I'm feeling generous and we're having a lot of fun here, um, I'm going to do a second giveaway, uh, on my own, on my own dime. I'll buy another one for somebody and, uh, we'll give another one away here. All right. We got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All right. Our next winner is Frosty. Frosty. Hey. All right. So we got Congratulations, Frosty. Congratulations, you two. All right. We got Frosty. Uh, we've got who's going to be getting a copy of the core rule book. We've got Duffy Steele who's going to be getting a copy of the uh, core rule book, and then uh, Pumpkin is going to be getting a core rule book plus a Fate toolkit, uh, which means apparently they're, that means that they're going to have to make their own Fate game for us to run on the. <laughs> That's what it sounds like uh, to me uh, on that. So. Um, Thanks everybody for uh for participating. Uh in oh, the- Frost Jack. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, Frost Jack. Well, the good news is the PDF is very, very cheap or a pay what you want. Um you, there's an SRD. You can get access to all these rules. It's nice, obviously. It's a it's a it's a beautiful little book here to have on your shelf in that nice digest size. I love it. But um, you know, you can have it. So I'll be reaching out to you three uh on the Discord to get your information so I can send these out to you. But um thank you I everybody. I really wish I knew what like material or how they made the covers of the fate books. Cause man, they feel so good to the touch. Yeah. Well, it's that evil hat does something. Yeah. Like, Blades of the dark has that same kind of feel mm-hmm. to it. All right. So pumpkin's going to be giving them away to a friend as a Christmas gift. Okay. That's, that's okay. totally reasonable. That's totally reasonable. Good for you. Um, and yeah, again, thanks YouTube for not no, for thanks for nothing. YouTube, because you, <laughs> there's all these really cool, like ways that you can like have people like 
you know, hashtag enter or entry in the chat and like it'll put them mm -hmm. into the contest. But none of them work with YouTube because of the API. Uh, but they're all designed. Where's for, the better business bureau? I, need I know a they're all designed. <laughs> they're all designed for Twitch. Although, you know, we've been thinking, I don't know if it'll it won't be anytime soon. But at some point we might start doing some stuff on Twitch and, and less on YouTube just because there's so many cool things that we want to be able to do with our live streams and live chats. We're, yeah. we're so interactive in our games, even our. Um, you know, whatever uh, it would uh, are like our actual plays are much, much more interactive than anybody else. Right. Like we're yeah. poll we're polling the audience and asking them what the party should do and who gets MVP and all this other stuff. But um, uh, we're like, very I first. think with uh, OBS, you can first actually first. stream to both. You could dual time. stream, yeah. you, but you're still kind of limited because if I do something, then it's only the people yeah. who are on Twitch can do that. But yeah, no, sure, you can't. Yeah. You can't. But um, so, yeah. Thanks everybody. Um, we got some super chats. Uh, we got some giveaways. We had a lot of fun. Uh, John, thank you so much for for hanging out with me. Yeah, uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, this was a lot of fun. And Hopefully I, I can join for some more in the future, maybe. Absolutely. Um, again, one of the perks of being a, a highest tier member of Night's Last Call, uh, in addition to getting all the uh, benefits of the lower tiers, is you get Get to hang out with us. You get to play with us uh, this Thursday, for example, coming up here in about four or five days. We're gonna be doing our pop it holiday adventure which itself was because a patron member tipped a lot of money during our halloween one but uh we're gonna be that's gonna be me and bob and smith but it's gonna be a bunch of patrons who are gonna be joining us we're gonna have damien we're gonna have donnie we're gonna have vin back um are you guys and, cosplaying like you did for the other one uh, well i'm gming so oh, okay. um, I don't have to cosplay, but no, I don't think people are going to be. Listen, <laughs> never say never, but we're going to have a lot of fun, crazy, wonky stuff as well. And uh, and again, if you're new to us and you're you're not a member of our Patreon or you're not subscribed, please do so. Uh, if you know, we talk about Pathfinder Two a lot on this channel, but we also are trying to spend more time on some of our favorite little indie games. Uh, that you know the 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 games that uh, I think really really help you become a better game master they help you become a better player and they can help you tell the kind of stories through this medium of ttrpgs that maybe your d20 based game isn't able to do as well as you'd like it to do so if you're interested in exploring these ideas i say give fate a chance so john i'm gonna let you uh have the final word so john final thoughts fate and 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 the whole mm. the whole system so i kind of mentioned it at the beginning and derek has kind of mentioned a couple times in there but Fate is not a silver bullet, but it does do a lot of things well. You can do a lot of things in 5e and Pathfinder, but depending on the game you're trying to play, you might be able to do them better in different games like Fate. So if I encourage everyone to try different games, whether that's Fate or otherwise, just to kind of expand their arsenal. One of the things we didn't talk about in this stream is the Fate Fractal and that everything oh, in Fate yeah. is kind of a oh, character. I, okay, I do uh, want to talk about that. Damn it. With the same, role, same rules as you would for building player characters. And that kind of thing can be translated to other games very easily as well. And in fact, Kingmaker kind of did it with mm. the kingdom building rules. Um, so there's when you play these other games, even if they're not your main game, right? You kind of you learn a lot of things you, you experience a lot of neat concepts that you can kind of take into the other these other games you play do play a lot so I, I always encourage people to just try other games give them a shot who knows maybe you like them maybe you don't maybe you learn something maybe you don't so. um yeah no i mean uh john that's a great point uh and i, I definitely want to touch about that real quick i know i said we were going to go um but that is um I, I'm, I told john we'd be finished at uh at seven but, <laughs> um which is going i'm going to bring up the character sheet really quick and uh, is this for a character? Sure. Is this for an army? Sure. Is this for a country, a nation, an organization, a starship? You, This concept of fate could be used for everything. You can use the combination of aspects, skills, and stunts, along with conditions, to represent anything in the game. For example, aspect could be she may not look like much, but she's got it where it counts. She's the fastest hunk of junk in the galaxy. Uh, smuggling, smuggling pods, um, you know, top gun, top gun turrets, you know, consequences. The hyperdrive's been deactivated. I'm building the Millennium Falcon using the fate character sheet. And now I can use the exact same things, uh, you know, skills. Well, sure, maybe they have different skills than humans, but you can you come up with a list of skills for vehicles, weapons, communicators, hyperdrive, uh, uh, engines. And now I can use the exact same framework to make a starship. And I can yep. 
go up against other starships. Or I could have an aspect for, you know, the country of Gallifred and the nation of Belzebop. And, you know, they're at war and they have different things. And we're using fate character sheets, essentially, to reflect everything. And that's what John was calling the fate fractal. The idea that you can zoom in or out to sort of any degree and it still looks like a fake character sheet. Yep. Um, and that is, so I think, elegant. it's so elegant and it's so powerful. And it means that you only have to learn this system once. And once you know this system of fate, of, of aspects and skills and stunts, you could do it to build anything and everything. Yep. And, it's, and it's it's just totally awesome. I just love it so much. Um, it's, well, it's certainly one of my favorite aspects of the of the game system. For sure. Um, Real quick before we go, Casey has one more question. Okay, last question. Answer at the beginning as well. Okay. Is fate best for five to 10 session seasons, three or four shots, a continuous campaign? We answer this at the beginning, but it is, in our opinion, it's it's best for like 10 to 20 sessions, maybe. Yeah. This guy's kind of the sweet spot. So something where you can have like a couple arcs in there, but not it's not going to be something you want to play for like two or three years or even one shots are kind of iffy with it. So. Yeah. I, I think, you know, you, you really want to let the game breathe. You want to have your character gain some consequences, have some aspects change, but because mm -hmm. you're not, you know, stacking up a ton of feats, you know, it's, I, I look at it as like, look at like one of the Marvel Disney TV shows, right? Those, you know, what are they like eight to 12, eight to 14 episodes? Like yeah, it's enough, one hour you know, yeah. one hour each. It's enough to tell, a complete arc with a couple different, you know, keystone moments throughout it. And here's the thing, have that ending, not planned, but you know, you'll start to see it. You'll start to feel it. Okay. We're, we're heading towards the conclusion of this arc and then right. end it. And then maybe you keep playing with those characters, but yeah. you pick it up in season two. Maybe it's two years later or, and, and maybe you have some people change a couple of their aspects. Maybe your character is now before, I had rivals at the Collegia Arcana. They had run me out. Maybe now I'm the headmaster and, you know, like change up the character aspects a little bit. Maybe somebody wanted to retire their character and they bring in a new person and we figure out how they're connected to the rest of the group. And then you can keep telling the story, but instead of just one big monolithic mega arc, it's a series of smaller vignettes. You know? There's different there's different levels of what they call milestones that you can kind of do different things with your character and change the story in different ways. And it, they, yeah. they fit pretty naturally. So basically, when you reach one of those, talk with your group, to, to, you know, decide whether it makes sense to keep going or start something new. And yeah. It becomes pretty natural. Uh, Brutus asking about Sentinels of the Multiverse RPG. Actually, Sentinels of the Multiverse uh, is going to likely be one of our upcoming first looks. Mm. I've never read the game uh and so whenever there's a game that's somewhat somewhat newer and i haven't read it uh it's a great candidate for our um uh, first look series where i buy the pdf and i going through it live first time with you uh seeing it for the first time and sort of reacting to it and that's definitely uh one of the ones that i'm, I'm interested in doing so uh so cool. no so no but yes <laughs> All right. Well, thanks again, John, for being here. Uh, thanks again to all our patrons for hanging out with us tonight and for supporting us, whether you are here tonight or not. And if you're just a casual viewer, thank you for your view. Make sure you subscribe and like and, you know, leave us a comment because the YouTube algorithm likes that. And maybe and maybe think about joining us, you know, and uh, and being a part of the Knights of the Last Call to three uh, family. Awesome stream. Really looking forward thanks to for playing tip, Fate Frost at Jack. some point. <laughs> yes, Frostjack. Thank you so much. And uh I, I'm sorry we gave you the the fake out on the on, <laughs> on the core rulebook win, but uh, there's too many people named Frost. Um, so thanks again, everybody, and uh, we'll see you Tuesday for just I think a regular Tuesday hangout stream. Thursday is going to be the big pop and holiday stream, uh, and then we'll probably have that week off between uh, Christmas and New Year's. But you know, you never know. I might get bored, so we, we might be back here. So all right, everybody, I will talk to you next time, and uh, we'll see you on nights of Last Call. Peace. Take care.